102 for five. Umpires are uh, wandering out into the middle, and the Australians are ready out behind them, eager uh, to get on with their work to uh, to try and uh, finish this game in this uh, middle session. There's still a lot of cricket left today. 68 overs that they have in which to uh, to bowl England out. Andrew Flintoff and Paul Collingwood are coming down the pavilion steps, running out into the sunshine, and uh, the crowd bustling back into their seats to uh, come and make sure they don't miss uh, the first ball. So uh, lots of cricket, lots of time at least, to enjoy. See, Mitchell Johnson uh, is going to bowl the first over after, uh, after the break. He's uh, loosening up bowling figures so far. He's taken one for 16 from eight. Hilfenhaus, two for 22 from his six overs. Siddle wicketless from seven. Horrocks, 12 overs, three maidens, two for 26. Michael Clark bowled a couple of speculative overs and uh, North won, but it's down to the big guns now who are going to try and uh, dislodge this pair and uh, bring in the lower order. Christopher Martin Jenkins is going to uh, start us off. I am indeed. Uh, I, I'm not sure if we thanked Sarah, John, Ben and Matt in the Riverside stand we have. Oh, uh, I had one of your... Well, I've actually... I'll, I'll be honest. I've had two of your Welsh cakes, one for Elevenses and one for lunch. And they were both excellent. Thank you so much. It's a lovely afternoon here. And uh, England have got to get themselves out of the mess they've got themselves into. With a lot of help from Australia. Because it doesn't look as though they're going to get any help from the weather. It's 102 for five. They are, remain perilously placed. And Mitchell Johnson's going to have a go after lunch. Australia, if they need it, will get a second new ball, and I think they will have a possible 15 overs with it. Which may be one reason why Ponting just had a little speculative look at uh, North and Clark before lunch, but he's gone back to a fast bowler at this end now. And here's Johnson to bowl to Collingwood, who's opened out his stance a bit. He bowls to him left arm over, very, very wide of the off stump, and Collingwood leaves it alone. Johnson bowling with two slips and a gully, a cover, a short extra, mid-off, mid-on, square leg and long leg. And judging by the energy of the long leg, who is Hilton House, it's going to be a bit of uh, fast bowling from both ends for the time being. Because he's getting ready to bowl. Johnson sloping left, runs in and bowls. Just outside the off stump, but nearer to it this time. A couple of looseners left alone by Collingwood. Just towards the end of that lunchtime discussion, there was mention of Robert Key making a, a hundred. Uh, Joe Danley has also made a, a not out hundred the last time I looked, but it's hard to think. He's out now, is he, Vic? No, 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 no. No, I see. I'm just thinking it's hard to think of a sort of David Steele of English county cricket at the moment if uh, the need for grafters is deemed to be what we need inside outside the off stump again from Johnson much too wide to make Collingwood play and he does I, um, I, I didn't hear all the lunchtime discussion but um, I mean there won't be any batting changes no there won't no, 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 and nor should there be if we're honest no you can't I mean what happened last time England got beaten quite badly at Lords 2005 same team yeah yeah that was Different pointed balls. out yeah, uh, and I mean they may shuffle with their bowling attack. I think, uh, no. but they won't shuffle with their batsmen at this stage. No, no. In goes Johnson from this Cathedral Road end, and Collingwood is very straight in defence, playing it to mid off. But uh, officially, anyway, Ian Bell is the next in line. I should imagine Jonathan Trot of Warwickshire has not got any further away. Got a big. Uh, He's been batting mainly on that pretty flat edge of Square. Anyway, um, as you say, it's, it's more likely that the bowling will be freshened up at Lord's if anything happens. Johnson away with even stride, short approach, bowls outside the off stump, short for a bowler of up to 98 mph, I mean, although that ball was only 80 mph. One thing he's shown in this match, in which he probably hasn't been anywhere near his very best, uh, Johnson, is a very clever, slower ball. Not that much slower, but he's 
made a couple of very important deceptions, not least getting Bopara out in the first innings. Away he goes, accompanied by his shadow, and bowls to Collingwood, who plays a ball that he had to play for the first time, down into the ground and back to the bowler. The start of a, a reasonably lengthy campaign you felt that over was from Johnson. He was just feeling his way back into some sort of rhythm, and no doubt he'll warm up into something more threatening soon. 102 for five. Well, you spotted Hawkeye, didn't you? <coughs> spotted Hilton House loosening, and it is going to be him from the River Taff home. And the Aussies, one of the things that Aussies have got right is their selection in this match, because I don't think many people thought Hilton House would get a game before we yeah, got to Clark, Cardiff. Clark, we thought, no. Yeah. He's got uh, important wickets in this match and has bowled well. There was some debate as to whether Horitz would play. And of course, he's got his quota of wickets and will have a lot more say in what happens this afternoon. Uh, so just about everything has uh, has worked for the Aussies, or they've made everything work mm. so far, but they haven't finished it off yet. Um, there's a couple of proud players out there. So it, it is actually a fantastic opportunity, in one sense, for Flintoff to try and demonstrate to one and all that he can still bat. Yes, it is. And he's facing Ben Hilfenhaus, the Tasmanian from the River Taff end, and he bowls just outside the off stump, and Flintoff gets in behind it, keeps his hands high, and plays it into the offside, and there's no run. Hilfenhaus from the largely rural island of Tasmania. Comes from the north, I think, rather than from Hobart. Lots of uh, wonderful wilderness. There he comes in, burly and pigeon-toed, and bowls of a good high action to Flintoff, who gets in behind it and plays it back up the pitch. A couple of slips in a gully for Hilton House. Nice fresh afternoon. It's not too hot or too cold today. It's, pro it's actually the, probably the best weather of the match. Here he comes again. He bowls to Flintoff very straight. Flintoff playing him from the crease. And he's slightly square on, but playing it with the middle of the bat in defence. Did you park your car in the car park today, Davy? I did. Uh, it's the first time I've done so, and um, the buggy system, it just works brilliantly, doesn't it? I know. No, I've just popped the car park during lunch. Oh, good. In comes Health and House, and it's pushing to the offside. And there's no run. That's available all day, is it, the service? To and fro? Well, it seems to be we found a buggy coming back. Uh, they've got these golf buggies that uh, the car park's not that far away, in fact. Exactly. <laughs> but, Good war. Yeah, but they've got a, a, it avoids the scrum. a fleet of buggies who will transport anyone anywhere, I suppose, within reason. I don't need to take you down to Marks and Spencer's to buy another laptop. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes Hilfenhaus over the wicket and bowls, and a very good over this has been. He's made Flintoff play at every ball. That's up, played straight to mid on. I've got a very nice Welsh student. Just getting a little bit of holiday pay, vacation pay. She hopes to join the BBC. Radio 4. Here comes Hilton House and Bills. Two slips in the gully and Bills. And it's played to mid off. And there's no run. Sounds she, like she you've drove more, the buggy very safely. <laughs> sounds like you've more or less offered her a job, Sam. Yeah, no, 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 I was careful not to. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I mean, that's those little added extras is what makes a huge difference um, to everyone who's come to Cardiff. I mean, there, there are reasons why you think this is not an ideal test venue, and I still maintain that the actual nature of the playing surface is, is not ideal. We, we could get a result here, and no one will quibble, but it's not the perfect type of surface for modern test cricket. But, I mean, they've done a fantastic job on, on those extra bits and pieces. We're very... Dare I say it, pampered in the press box with people rushing around getting coffee if you like. No. Here's Mitchell Johnson, he bowls to Collingwood, who plays it into the gully off the front foot. There's no run. 
I'm just thinking what, what, what um, are the others will have to do to catch up. All those security men at heading there will have to beam <laughs> a welcoming <laughs> smile at you. Um, they've got to have yes, a buggy to take you. If, if we've got to go around the rugby pitch, <laughs> got to go around the buggy. Yes. Can't be expected to walk. <laughs> There comes Johnson again. Left arm over, he bows the right-handed Collingwood outside the off-stump, no run. Oh, yeah, the standard has been set. I mean, to be fair, we nearly always, when we, although there's no test matches this year, when we go to Trent Bridge, we always feel, oh, you know, everyone's so friendly and uh, mm. keen to see you. <clears throat> there's a character right by the lift there who always greets everyone like long-lost friends. Oh, a charming Scotsman, yeah. yes. yes. Um, so, you know, it's not exclusively Cardiff who cracked no, this no, one. No, no, everybody's very friendly. Such nice people in cricket, as Brian Johnson always used to say. <laughs> in comes Johnson, both short of the length from the leg stump, it's tucked away to square leg and there's no run. And indeed, when we were up at Chester Street, you did a cup. You made Chesterfield Street this year. I can't remember, but yes, it, well, yeah, of course you did for a day or two. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's as a right. late sub. <laughs> yes, that's it. Um, you go up there, and they, they treat you like long lost friends. Yeah, and they do it all. Everybody's friendly, yeah. really. But uh, the, the, the whole plan here has been beautifully executed. And congratulations to Glamorgan for that. In comes Johnson. Bows very wide of the off stump, left alone, and that is a. a Mr. Doctor has made a decision. He's Good decided Lord. that's a wide. He's getting a stare from Ricky Ponting. As he, a is, he is. Ponting's arms are kimbo. Oh, he's complaining. Well, I think it's best to let it go. <laughs> it's, 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 it doesn't really it, matter. It was a wide, really. I mean, it, 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 when it passed, it just about went over the top of the return crease. I think they need every run they get, can get. If they could make Australia bet again, it would be something of an achievement. They're 103 for five. In comes Johnson. Bowles, and that's an appeal for LBW. Not out, he says. Now, I wonder if Ponty hadn't glared at him whether he would have said out. It was worth a shout. He was on the back foot. He'd come across his stumps. You Let's think see. it's got a jag back in. Bit high, don't you think, Vic? A bit high. A little bit off stump, too. But it might have been missing off stump. Don't think he got an inside edge. Mm. But it did come back. It's very difficult being an Australian captain or a test captain now because I think one of the, 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 the television men, the television men, have a camera on you <laughs> through yeah, the entire day. Absolutely, Johnson pulls and uh, it's just played to bed off, and there's no run. Collingwood basically staying in the crease, waiting and playing it late under his nose. He's, he's 35, not out, and he's made fewer mistakes than most. Although he did have a Horrible over against Horrids. I mean, actually, the television camera could get anyone at any time, but um, you certainly you want impeccable personal habits, don't you? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Johnson again from this Cathedral Road embers it a slower ball outside the off stump, further pitched up, inviting Collingwood to drive. Collingwood resists all temptation. Head down and goes to have a chat with Flintoff. 103 for five. Did you ever take part in any long and meaningful rearguard of which you were proud of? Um, well, let's have a think. I mean, there would have been some at county level. I mean, at test level, I did, but it wasn't that meaningful. Oh, it, uh, I got lots Pakistan. of runs. I got runs with Gower in Pakistan, um, yeah, a couple of times. Very well or, like, yeah. um, which, you know, at the time felt long and meaningful, but <laughs> we, uh, history suggests, however, <laughs> that no, no. it wasn't that meaningful. No, no, no. Uh, um, actually, in the last test of that series, Foxy, Graham, Graham Farrow and I put on quite a few after England were 100 for five, but it wasn't the first, first innings of the match rather than the second, I think. The, uh, what I'm sort of leading to mm. is that there's a peculiar satisfaction, is there not, in that oh, yeah. sort of uh, achievement? Yeah. But England are miles away from achieving it as uh, Hilton House bowls and again makes Flint off play at seven balls. He's bowled at him since lunch and all of them have been dead straight. And, and Flint off played it to mid wicket. More often in, in county cricket. But there comes a point in a partnership, and I'm not saying this pair have got there yet, where, you know, a pattern emerges. They get used to the pace of the pitch. They get more relaxed about the fact they're not scoring very quickly. 
uh, and there's a sense that we might be getting somewhere here. Elfenhaus bowls and uh, Flintoff off the back foot, despite being a little bit tucked up and close to his off stump, hits it away square, looking for runs that time, forward of square, but playing it straight to Horitz, who will soon be bowling again, uh, uh, no doubt. Yeah. I, um, I mean, I think the way <laughs> Australia have gone about it after they, they, none of these sweeper fielders now, of course, a very fairly conventional field. I reckon it bottle Flintoff up. He'll, he'll make a mistake, is what they're thinking. Yeah, Hilfenhaus bowls to him, and he's certainly achieving that. It's very accurate stuff. That was a no-ball, however, called by Alim Dar. As that great left boot came down just over the line. I don't know Hilfenhaus's height, but he must be 6'2", 6'3", that sort of height, and uh, I should imagine he's certainly not anything smaller than size 11 <laughs> by European... Uh, Boot sizes. Up he comes again from the river end and bows to Flintoff very straight on the off stump. Flintoff back and across. His first instinct was to want to hit that off the back foot through the covers, realised he couldn't. Goes for a little walk to short square leg. Much to prove, Andrew Flintoff. He didn't. Uh, all the fire and brimstone amounted only to one wicket in the end in the, with the ball. Elfenhaus bows to him, he's back again and plays it to mid-wicket. A little bit um, le more relaxed in that stroke, which could also mean a little bit looser. No run. And Elfenhaus gets a word of advice now from his skipper. Ricky Ponting, I don't, can't have been too often in Australian history where there have been two genuine Taswegians playing together in the side together, t together. but um, Ponting, of course, also from Tasmania. In comes another no ball from Helfenhaus. It was on a full length on the off stump, and Flintoff played it back to the bowler. Alim Dar helpfully just explaining to Hilfenhaus why he called it, but I don't think he really needed any explanation. 105 for five. Ponting has now gone to, probably had the ball before, he's gone to a very straight mid-on, a position that Vaughan employed for Hayden in the last home series here. He bowls to, uh, to Flintoff, hits him on the pads, the ball bounces down into the gully, and that one was missing leg stump, but it seemed to dip into him late. The and the appeal the was stifled. Maybe, suspect, maybe he hit it. I, I guess he must have done it, otherwise they didn't, wouldn't have stifled the appeal. Oh, oh, no, I think no, he hit no. the pad first, but it was yeah, missing yeah, leg stump. It was missing leg, but it was... Uh, it's what they're after. They've bottled him up, bottled him up. There's a little scoring opportunity, all foolish in length. Leg stump. If he's playing really relaxed cricket, he'd probably hit that. May have reverse swung a little bit, perhaps. <laughs> He bows again from the river end and Flintoff drives sweetly to mid-off but can't get a run because it goes straight to the fielder. So 105 for five, very accurate stuff from Ben Hilfenhaus. Get the impression I'm in the minority in this box in that nearly everyone is twittering. I gather you're a late convert to twittering. I mean, look, Malcolm's so at it. it. I've seen Malcolm. He's at it. Henry said he's going to set a site up, if that's the right terminology. It's a very, very extraordinary shortly. phenomenon. And I, I just, you know, I like to show Aggers that I'm... Um, I'm 21st century man. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, he thinks I'm a complete idiot and he's only partially right. <laughs> 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 uh, but um, it, it, it does have an extraordinary response. I don't know how, how many Malcolm's up to, but I'm already into the thousands in the first 24 hours of... Oh, you know you're going you're gonna to upset Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, He's probably... He, in comes the start of a new over from Johnson and his first ball gets past the outside edge of Collingwood. And that was just the right length from Mitchell Johnson, who's warming to his task here. And that's, that's the first time he's beaten Collingwood since lunch. A mere 715, Chris. Well, uh, uh, keep working. I, I you're, don't know. you're busier than I am. <laughs> just, just as a statistical <clears throat> point, I've had four overs and a ball since lunch. Nothing from the bat. Just two, two no balls and a wide. 
And a bit of reverse swing, I reckon, there. Mm. A bit of movement in the air of some sort, anyway. It, it's, it's Two balls left that have swung now mm. in the last couple of minutes. Johnson bows with three slips in the gully, and Collingwood plays it down into the gully. A sliding stop by Hussey, moving to his right. Mm. The timeless Australia cricketer, Michael Hussey. He, he looks like he could have come out of any era of Australian cricket. Put a moustache on him anyway for one or two of the eras. Well, the next remake of Polyline. <laughs> yes, he can take one of the parts. Uh, yeah. the casting directors need look no further. <laughs> well, Mr. Cricket. Then comes Johnson and bowls short of a length. And Collingwood gets up into his toes. Plays that well, but it was a good ball, a little bit quicker. On a Perth pitch or maybe even the Lord's one if it's got some pace. Um, that would have reared a bit further and been even more awkward to play. Very strong Johnson and a thoughtful bowler. And he's asking... He says, do you, are you thinking about putting his square leg back, but Ponting doesn't want him to go. No. And I think Ponting's right. He keeps three slips in a gully. Johnson bowls again to Collingwood. That's down the leg side. Collingwood fiddled at it, missed it. If he'd got, well, there's a long leg on the boundary, there's a square leg and a mid on, an orthodox square leg, that's all there is on the on side. Well, I think Ponting's right because I just sense that this bowling dry, not giving any runs away, it's, it's just making the batsmen a little bit twitchy. They're, they're fairly experienced campaigners, obviously Collingwood and Flintoff, but they haven't got a run from the bat, as Malcolm pointed out, since lunch, and I think they just want to get a little bit of strike rotation. Johnson bowls again, Flintoff has to defend, he does so solidly, Johnson feels off his own bowling. England today, if you haven't heard, lost Peterson in the fourth over of the day, bowled by Hilfenhaus for eight, playing no stroke to a ball that plucked out his off stump like a tooth. Strauss caught Haddon bowled Harrods, Horitz, 17. Uh, he was cutting, he just square cut the previous four ball, he tried to do the same to the next one, it bounced a bit more and he got a top edge. And Pryor was caught off the glove, also cutting at Horitz for 14. Johnson in bright sunshine, bows the right-handed Collingwood, who leg glances for four, despite a very good effort by Haddon, leaping to his left. No, I thought uh, he got some bat on that, but I'm by Dr. of Signals. Leg buys. So England limp to 109 for five. Vic, you're looking a bit restive, but uh, for the no. time being anyway, you're going to be joined no, I'm by I'm Jim going Maxwell. Away. Yeah, well, it's tense cricket, not much in the way of run scoring. All the runs since lunch, and there's only been seven of them, have come from what Jim would probably still call sundries. <laughs> Is that right? Yep, sundries. Although uh, Tim Lane years ago came up with a, a, a good one for extras, he called it that, at the 12th batsman, Xavier Traz. <laughs> Extra uh, yes, class, yes, yeah. 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 Although it was quite clever. Well, it is. Uh, very it must have confused a lot of your listeners. Hilfen House bowls, <laughs> and it's pushed away on the uh, offside down towards mid off by Flintoff, and there's no run. I, I, I'm sure. I can't remember where now. I'm sure there's an Australian scoreboard, someone will remind me, that does use that term, and not sundries, but. Uh, Hmm. I'm just trying to search my, my brain for it, but... Um, don't, don't, I shouldn't agonise too much no. about it, Jim. Well, that's what we've had mm -hmm. since lunch. Xavier Traz, Sundries, nothing off the bat as uh, Flintoff's on the back foot. Almost a chance to score, but he hit it too well in the direction of mid-off and Siddle's fielding down there. So, uh, today, uh, early success for Australia. Peterson losing his off stump, not playing at a ball from Hilfen House. Knocked it out of the ground. And then Strauss, having hit Horitz before, got one that bounced a little bit more. The next delivery, and he aimed another cut shot, and he nicked it to Haddon, who took it with some exultation. Strauss out for 17. Here's Hilfenhaus, he bowls, and a big drive for four. Wacko through the covers. Splendid cover drive. And a very authoritative shot from Flintoff gets the first runs off the bat since lunch. He thumped it. He's 15 and it's 5 for 113. But it was a controlled thump. I mean, it was a proper cover drive. 
uh, a rare half volley, a little bit of width from Hilvin House, and Flintoff put it away. I think a, a product spoke to Hilvin House is probably saying, yeah, just get a few more balls up on a length. See what it does as he comes in and bowls, and he beats him outside the off stump like that. Tempted him, and he played a poor shot, really. He just fiddled at the ball outside the line. But Hilfenhaus is getting up on a length, trying to get the batsman forward a bit more. And you just might be able to do something a bit of shape, a bit of deviation, and it almost deviated off the edge of the bat. Yeah, well, the previous delivery was a half volley, and that one was a good length, a little bit of width, and Flintoff was tempted to play a shot, which he didn't like afterwards. Lucky not short, to get an edge. Short mid wicket, short cover, Hilfenhaus bowls and a short mid on. And Flintoff plays off the back foot, just sent back into his stumps. He's bowling a few uh, little break backers here and there, just coming in off the, the seam perhaps. And now North's being dispatched. Well, I think he's dispatched North to the square leg boundary, dispatched that. I think he wants to get Flintoff to have a go against uh, Johnson. He's almost giving him one. I don't know. Mm. That's my only possible explanation for those two field changes. Well, he hasn't bowled to him as yet since lunch as Hilfenhaus has Flintoff driving off the edge where it's second slip. <laughs> it's gone for four. <laughs> and no it was ball. a no ball, so it didn't matter. But uh, the way Flintoff has played in this over, I mean, why wouldn't you have two in the slips? There's every chance he's going to snick one. And uh, he didn't know it was a no ball. He just played at it instinctively. And uh, again, Hilfenhaus for the third time since lunch, overstepping. But that was not a controlled stroke. And, and that was a, straight to second. That was a rare example of the ball carrying mm. through the slip cordon. But no one there. It was a no ball. It was it was just about half volley length, actually. It's not quite. Didn't execute the shot very well. Anyway, he's got four for it. It's a bizarre field. Van House goes in again and Flintoff leaves the ball. That left him outside the off time, but he was playing very carefully, looking to make sure that uh, there was no need to go at the ball with any extravagance, and he carefully av avoided it, allowed it to pass. He's 19, Flintoff, Collingwood's 35, five for 118. A little bit happening in uh, that over, and uh, Johnson is going to continue down here at the Cathedral Road end. The other batsman out was Pryor, trying to cut a ball that turned and bounced and uh, off the glove he was caught by Clark at slip for 14. The score was then 70, it's now 118. Which is some some sort of progress. It's, it's 48 runs obviously, but it's quite a lot of overs as well. Here's Johnson moving into Collingwood. Collingwood pushes just on the crease, sends the ball down towards mid off. He's got um, two slips and about Somewhere between third and fourth, but up a yard or two is Philip Hughes. Because uh, Johnson is getting a little bit of angle, maybe some movement at the off stump. And uh, now it's happening. North's Johnson, going out. They're, they're, well, uh, Johnson's going to come around the wicket for yeah. a start. Uh, we did see, I thought, just a glimmer of reverse swing mm. um, from Johnson just now. He's got lots of little options. He'll, he'll bowl some skinny bounces, I suspect. He'll try and get the ball to reverse swing away from the right-hander. He'll toss in that off-cutter, and he's got a good one. We know that much um, from the first innings. Even when he's not bowling well, I always think he's a threat because he's got the knack of getting wickets, hasn't he? Mm. Yes. Uh, yes. Mixing it up intelligently. So around the wicket, he bowls to Collingwood. Collingwood defends a ball that's up near the line of the stumps. Not a full length, but it was straight on. Um, we've got a challenge going between the Australian and English primary clubs. Um, in Australia, the, the habit for some time is that uh, the members donate $5 every time an Australian player gets out for a primary. Not that we've had any on either side in this game. Johnson comes up to bowl, back uh, forward rather goes, uh, Collingwood plays around the offside. And the challenge has been issued by Richie Benner to uh, Derek Underwood, who is the uh, patron president of the English Primary Club. So a full wide ball from Johnson, it must have been close to a wide, 
is allowed to pass by. So the idea is there'll be a donation, voluntary donation, uh, from members of either English or Australian primary clubs, to, depending on what happens in this series with players getting out for primaries. If we watch uh, Johnson coming up around the wicket and it bowls another full and very wide delivery, which was uh, awkward for Haddon to take. It landed past the crease and uh, whacked into his glove. So can he get it on target this time? Johnson bowls down the leg side and that's a loose delivery that uh, Collingwood for a moment was trying to pursue and flick away, but uh, he didn't. So it was a wild old over from Mitchell Johnson. Five for 118, and he seemed to lose his radar completely when he went around the wheel. He did. It was, it was a maiden over. It was one of the most ordinary maiden overs I've seen for some time, though. Mm. But he's trying everything, and he's allowed to in this situation. I think he was bowling very full, looking for a bit of reverse swing. That didn't work, and then he fired one down the leg side. I, d I see, I think it's well, Peter Siddle. Maybe he hasn't been told by Ricky Comp Ponting to warm up, but he's... He's doing some warm-up exercise. He might be saying, well, that was a load of garbage. I can do better than that, Skip. I'm ready for you. There's still another 61 overs to come today. We've had 44. And England have lost five wickets for 118. And Flintoff looking to the attack the bowling when he can and the Australians won't mind that because they'll, they'll feel that he might make a mistake in so doing. As Hilfenhaus bowls to him now and he's forward and he's taken on the pad but maybe with a little bit of inside edge and going down the leg side in any case. So a slip and a gully, a deep point, short cover mid off, mid on. Uh, well there's a, a short mid on which is a position that Ricky Ponting uses quite a lot Although I can't ever remember anyone being caught there. But, uh, and then a man behind him at mid on, a short mid wicket, and a deep backward square. Maybe once or twice India could have occurred on the slower pitches. Hilfenhaus bowls, back goes uh, Flintoff into his stumps to defend down in front of him. So Flintoff's added eight runs, but Collingwood hasn't added a run. There have been a few no balls and a wide. But a partnership worth 48, giving uh, English supporters uh, hope that there may be a long partnership. Hilfenhaus with now two slips. He's hit in the air by Flintoff, and he's hit well for four, but it wasn't too far away from north. It is slowing up, but uh, it should reach the boundary, or will it? No, it's going to stop inside the boundary in that long pocket. And they ran a very easy three. They could almost have run four. But uh, Flintoff was just sauntering along. He picked that off the line of the leg stump. He hit it in the air. And perhaps because of all that rain, the outfield's a bit slow in the, the deep pockets. And it's the 50 partnership for England as a result of that stroke. Five for 121. Flintoff to 22. And he's just adjusting his equipment. Jeffrey Boycott's uh, in alongside me. He's always going to give the bowlers a chance, it seems, uh, Andrew Flintoff, because he likes to well, the ball. Yeah, I don't know why Horrocks isn't bowling, though, at mm. one end. I want to bowl Mitchell Johnson. I, I think Health House has bowled the whole match really well. I'd have definitely bowl Horrocks. And uh, because Freddie doesn't, doesn't start very well against the spin. And uh, there's an Australian leading the German Grand Prix at the Nürburgring. Here comes Hilfenhaus to bowl, and Collingwood defends down on the on onside. Mark Webber is ahead after 39 of the 60 laps. Britain's Jensen Button sixth. And you can pick up commentary of that if you want it over on Five Live. But um, it's a good Aussie day. Mark Webber was uh, along at the uh, Australian uh, game at Worcester, talking to a few of the boys. I think he's quite friendly with Ricky Ponting. More from Hilford House, he bowls to Collingwood. Collingwood's forward and just knocking the ball down at his feet. Yes, what to make of uh, Johnson's uh, bowling in this spell too? Not much. Uh, I just feel he's, he's slinging the ball more than I've uh, seen him in the past. Mm. I know his arm's not been high, but 
Mm. He seems lower more, yeah. and, and therefore his accuracy is all over the place. I mean, certainly he occasionally bowls really good balls, but he's not got very many in the difficult area. Hilfen House outside the off stump, Collingwood lets it pass, and that's at the end of the over. Yes, I think a, a lot's been uh, said about his development and the fact that in South Africa he found the inswinger. But I think the truth is, when he bowled the inswinger, it was almost an accident. I don't think he can make it happen at will at all. Well, that's even more difficult for us batsmen. <laughs> well, again, he only bowled six in the whole series, but mm. I think he got three wickets with three of them because uh, the batsmen were all of a sudden, bang, what was that? And you, then you start looking for it, don't you? But uh, well, I haven't seen him bowl one so far here. Well, the guy who's caused most problems this innings has been the off-spinner. Mm. Whoever he's bowled at, he's caused problems to. Yeah. And Ricky's decided not to bowl him. That's extraordinary. Now, I'll certainly bowl one seamer straight after lunch, whether it's Mitchell Johnson or Hilfenhaus. And, uh, but, as I say, the spinners cause a lot of problems. They've been ultra defensive, ultra cautious. They should be a little cautious, a little defensive, but not ultra. They've never driven him once. And balls popped up. They've had batting pads. They've had played it on the on the thigh pad and nearly got out. Played and missed. I mean, I say before it looked like Jim Laker if he's bowling hand grenades. So I mean, get him on, and especially straight after lunch when they got a start. Freddie's mm. never been a good starter against spin when it turned. Slow bowl is not so bad when it's a flat pitch and does nothing, because he's got such power, he can loft him over the infield and it goes for six, it's a piece of cake to him. But when it turns, it's a different ball game. Well, Johnson's getting his first opportunity since lunch at Flintoff. He's over the wicket, he bowls to him now, and he gets the angled delivery, which he ignores with three slips and the gully behind him. Yes, I think uh, certainly in the days of Shane Warne, uh, it would have been on, you know, first up almost every session unless there was a new ball involved because uh, he was the go-to man and I think you make a good point that De Horitz at the moment is the obvious go-to man, particularly with this older ball. But maybe they feel he's going to get some reverse movement with this ball, which is in its uh, 46th over. And he's got Flintoff down there trying to make him have a flirt. He doesn't. He lets it go outside the off stump. He is getting it to go a little bit, but whether he can get it in the right spot to entice an edge and whether or not the edge, will, if it comes, carries is another matter too down at that end. Well, he hasn't made them play many balls and the off spin will make you play every ball. Mm. Hilfenhaus, on the other hand, has made them He's play. He's a very good bowler. Mm. I think he could be one of the bowlers, if not the bowler of the series. He... Uh, does very, very well, just a little bit, a little bit of movement. Here comes Johnson, he bowls a ball that's hit hard off the back foot by Flintoff. He stood up and uh, sent that with the excellent timing towards the cover boundary and the result will be three again. A little bit of dampness in the outfield, perhaps slowing that shot, which was well struck and it gets him away from the strike. Down to the other end and moves to 25. Collingwood still hasn't scored a run since lunch and the totals moved to 124. You see, for a big fella, that went for three. I mean, a lot of batsmen, we, it was a lovely shot off the back, which was a little firm push. He didn't even hit it hard, but because of his power, mm. excellent time, and it went for three, nearly for four. Now, Johnson's going to try around the wicket at Collingwood once again. Well, maybe he feels he can just get him on the crease, nip one away or straighten it, but... Uh, his radar was terrible in the last over when he went around the wicket. He bowled three wide deliveries, two full and wide outside the off stump and then one down the leg side. And Collingwood just checking his guard from Billy Doctrove, maybe just adjusting it for this angle. Now Johnson up around the wicket, bowls again outside that off stump. It bounced twice <laughs> before it got to the keeper. So again, he's not forcing the batsman to play. Seems a waste. Mm. He'll be, he'll be if he makes them play. He can be awkward because mm. it's quite obvious he's very wide on the crease with his slingy action and around the way he can't get much closer because he'll run on the pitch. And and often the ball pitches and actually then goes away almost like a cutter. Johnson coming in to bowl a ball that's defended easily. Collingwood just leaning forward and patting it away up on the uh, the offside. So it's, it's probably time for a change. Siddle 
abhorrence. Where's he going to go? I wonder at what point he will think, hmm, we might have to give Cadditch a bowl. But uh, he did that in the first innings. We've had Clark bowling a few overs. North bowled one. But Get the off spinner on. Yeah. Yeah, might be happening in a moment. So Johnson down here at the Cathedral Road end. Beautiful afternoon sunshine, a full house here. Here to see the final day. And then still a tense battle. As Johnson bowls a ball that's pitched up and uh, played with that short back lift and a little controlled push out on the offside. Five for 124, Fleet off 25. Collingwood hasn't added since lunch, 35. More from uh, Jeffrey Boycott and then Jonathan Agnew. Well, it's not so much more from me, it's more from the batsman, more of the same. Um, I think Collingwood has the ability to play all day in a more cautious defensive mode, keeping his wickets in hand, just picking up the odd ball to score off. But uh, Flintoff is the concern. I mean, he has talent, Andrew, as an attacking player. Uh, but can he hold himself together without making mistakes? I mean, he made one flirting drive, there was no second slip. But even if he had been, it was a no ball, but it was a poor shot. And, and this is the thing with Andrew, is, is can he alter his game, change his game and bat for a long period? Here comes Hilfenhaus, he bowls to Flintoff, back into line, playing a very straight bat to extra cover. Well, he's got a chance to let's answer those questions today, Geoffrey. Can you understand why Horitz isn't bowling? I can't. He's looked the most dangerous bowler all day. Of course, mm -hmm. problems to everybody. I can't understand it. I mean... There's a Cardiff wave going around the ground, the first time we've seen that. Going around in a clockwise fashion, around about uh, 11 o'clock at the moment as we look out over the ground. And in comes Hilfenhaus from that end and bowls a nice looking shot from Flintoff. Forward, back coming through straight, hitting it hard, but straight to mid off. 124 for five. So 115 behind still. Nice sunny day, a fresh breeze. House turns in the distance, or near distance anyway. Up it comes again, bowls, and uh, Flintoff drives along the ground. It bounced, I think, once before going past Collingwood there at, at mid-on. I'm also surprised, Jonathan, that they haven't bounced him. Because if he hits one for four, so what? But if he happens to mistime it or anything, makes a mess of this, you know, it's worth a four, isn't it? Hmm? At the moment, they're being very disciplined. Bowling uh, line and length, Hilfenhaus bowls the bouncer. Jeffrey, you're tuned into him, but it went over his head. And, and you need to also it. ball, Andrew, a, a slower ball from time to time because he drives very firmly, doesn't he? Yeah. And if he doesn't slightly pick it up, he's going to spoon it to somebody because he hits it so powerfully. Uh, I don't think he can check himself. When he, when he decides to play a shot, Andrew, it's full-blooded with power, isn't it? Mm. Hilfenhaus bowls, Flintoff stands up, plays off the front foot to mid-off. Chris joining us, well, the men out today. With Peterson in the fourth over for eight, bowled by Hilfenhaus, playing no shot. Strauss trying to force a short wide ball from Horitz, was taken by Haddon, the wiki keeper for 17, and then Pryor tried to cut against the spin, ill-advised, certainly. And was taken at slip also off Horrocks. So that's uh, Flintoff going back again, playing to the bearded Hilfenhaus. 124 for five. England are 115 behind. And it looks as if Johnson is going to uh, continue from this end. Mm -hmm. He's a bit of a mixed game for me, uh, uh, Mitchell Johnson. He, he, whether his arm is always this low. No, it a, wasn't. No, he just he didn't. It doesn't look as if he had. He's had He's had rhythm in this. He's still been up around the 88, 89 miles an hour, but he, he hasn't been quite as threatening as I thought he uh, thought he might be. Yeah, well, he hasn't bowled great for me, but he's got no. four wickets in the match, hasn't he? Yeah. Three and one. You take that. It's like a batsman. If you're not playing your best, take a couple of fifties. I can see on, on hard, hard pacey pitches, pitches being, being, very being nasty, yes. The, the best idea of him, a good idea, was doing Strauss with the short ball. He was going to look for one of his favourite pulls, one that's mm. too quick for him. It was on to him, hit his glove, and he tried to stop himself, it was too late. 
Johnson from round the wicket bowls at very low arm and uh, poor shot from Collingwood really the ball kept low but under his bat there was a very tentative looking prod outside the off stump Collingwood knows it is going for a walk Flintoff's coming down to have a word with him and Collingwood plays a much more uh, solid looking defensive shot than that offering there and the ball was actually coming down there was a bit of argy-bargy I think between Johnson and, and Peterson this morning at, at practice whether that uh, unsettled Peterson this morning or not I don't know but uh, of eyeball to eyeball stuff apparently in goes Johnson bowls short turned off his hip by Collingwood away into the leg side only a single tell us more Jonathan well, I don't know much about it except that there was a bit of a little bit of a, a scene apparently between uh, the two of them 37th ball at uh, Malcolm, I can't, I can't lip read from here. So it's his first run since lunch, isn't it? That's it's 32nd Thank ball. Well, <laughs> so I'll tell you about KP. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, no, there's some sort of row over practice, I think, down there where the, where the practice pitches are. So no one's quite got to the bottom of it. But, uh, bit of eyeball to eyeball stuff. Mm. Apparently. Ego to ego, was it? Oh, or rather, know. eyeball to eyeball. I'm not sure what it right. was, but... Uh, uh, they were separated, but that way in goes Johnson again from our end. Bowls, oh, that goes past Flint off a slower ball. Pushing forward at it. Beaten by the angle more than anything well, else. Somebody tell Ricky Ponting to put the off spinner on. Or do I need to get a telephone? Goodness gracious me. They've been out there 50 minutes or more. Mm. 45 minutes, is it? 50 minutes? Goodness gracious. <laughs> Well, there are three slips in the galley lined up. And Johnson again, very dark haired, bowls short, hurled in halfway down. Flintoff ducks underneath that. Johnson follows through. Flintoff doesn't bother looking at him. I rather think it'll be a good contest when we get on a hard piece. Mitchell Johnson bowling at Flintoff, because he'll get his first year of bounces, but it'll be just the same when Flintoff gets Mitchell Johnson batting. He had a bat this match, but he can back and Johnson and mm. Flintoff can bowl and I think either will be rather, I'll be interested, because usually the Lodge pitch is a bit harder than this and well, a bit quicker. Yeah. There's new re relayed mm. ones, certainly. Johnson bowls, short of a length again, and Flintoff has plenty of time to get behind it and play towards a bit off. But apart from that pitch, really, I'm not sure we can expect much pace and bounce. I was going the oval goes through a bit in the, the first couple of days, but... It is flat. Yeah. Headingly, it turns up there these days, doesn't it? Turn? Never known a test match won by spinners at Headingley. Well, they've been quite successful up there recently, in recent years. Monty likes bowling at Headingley. How many matches has he won? Uh, well, there's a Pakistan. Well, he hasn't done too bad. You look at the records. Spinners up there recently have done OK. In goes Johnson. Bowls, Flintoff drives, catch it, they shout. He's gone through the slips, or he's past Gully anyway. Ponting was up there, jumping up. But he's managed to get it away. Again, not a controlled shot at all. And uh, he picks up a run, 126 for five. Flintoff now has 26, Collingwood has 36. It's a lot of bottom hand there, uncontrolled, the bat coming through. A bit of a slicing shot. Mm. I think you've got your spinner on, have you, Geoffrey? Yeah, but it, it's ridiculous. You see, from a batsman's point of view, thinking of it, I know what it's like. You've given them a sighty, you've given them 50 minutes batting. The confidence is up, the footwork is better because they've had some bowling. Mm. What you want to do is get your most threatening bowler, is the word I'd use, not about pace or spin. Who is the most likely to get wickets on the particular pitch you're playing on, on the particular pitch? It's been horrid. Yeah. So you get him at the batsman before he has time to get in. It's just like if it was a flat pitch, who would you bowl? You know, if it's a flat pitch, would you bowl Horitz or Dennis Lilly at his best? You're kidding me. You know, it's not even a thought, is it? No. You bowl your, your most threatening bowler. You don't let them get a few balls. You don't let them get confidence. You don't let them get a sighter of the ball. No, I agree with that. And this is why Ricky will go down as a fine captain, because his team has won lots of matches. He isn't a fine captain. He's better than ours, mind you. That's not <laughs> difficult. Now, in comes Horitz from the far end, over the wicket, bowls, and... Uh... Flintoff goes back into his crease, steers that away into the onside. He's got four men around him, plus the keeper. Two of them are wearing helmets. See, as you know, Andrew Flintoff is better at hitting the spinner 
Now he's been in a while, got a few runs, he's liable to hit him and actually come off. If you've had to do that right straight away... Here he is again, Flintoff again defends with the spin, Horrocks fields. He wasn't hitting him before lunch, was he? No. He was poking, he was careful, mm -mm. Well, we know he doesn't like starting against spin. But, but he'll be a lot better now, he's had 50 minutes better, or oh, there's a good chance he'll be a bit better. 126 for five, 113 behind. Horrocks, the off spinner from the far end, bowls, and no shot there from Flintoff. Getting outside his off stump, taking his bat out of the way. Quite an unusual one there, and he did it without actually thrusting a pad down the pitch. But, uh, didn't spin enough to produce uh, an LBW appeal. Horrocks comes in again, bowls, and uh, Flintoff pats it back to him, 126 for five. I bet he hasn't patted back many spinners in his career, Andrew Flintoff, has he? <laughs> no. well, he's got mid on up, <laughs> mid off is up. There's a big gap out there at deep mid wicket. He wants to have a go. The men out on each side though. And now he uh, plays from the crease again, pushing it away for Ponting to field. It's silly point is a deep point and a deep square leg. So that's where Ponting has his men out. So uh, for the sweep essentially, and for the short ball that Horrocks occasionally puts in there, but also perhaps inviting the cut shot that Pryor, of course, has lured unwisely into playing Flintoff forward, Ponting fields again to end uh, that over 126 for 5 and uh, this is rather odd oh of course as T was being T being changed pushed back a bit because of the extended times because of taking a drinks break more drinks? yeah they've only been playing 50 minutes golly me are there two drinks breaks in this session? there must be it's taken some by surprise taking England by surprise I think <laughs> Because uh, no one's coming out. The, the umpires have thought about it. Oh dear! Well, here come the Australians now. But anyway, drinks break after 50 minutes, Jeffrey. I won't re say anything on that because no. it'd be unrepeatable. I mean, absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. Well, the Shafiats bring out the drinks for uh, the bats when they come the ground staff. They're a bit surprised as well by that. Mm. Drinks after 50 minutes. Anyway, 126 for five. There's still 56 overs to go today. The bowl 49, so in other words, there's, uh, what, uh, 31 overs to go until a new ball is available for, for Australia. Collingwood's played quite nicely. Mm. I mean, he played and missed one ball from uh, Mitchell Johnson. Uh, other than that, since lunch, he's looked pretty comfortable. He's kept a short back lift. He's not trying to do anything silly or uncomplicated. He, he realises that most important thing of all, he's the last of the recognised batsmen. And I will say this. From tailenders' point of view, I batter with a lot of them. I know Andrew's not a tailender, but the tailenders to come, they do bat a lot better if they bat with one quality batsman, one of the recognised batsmen. Because while there's a recognised batsman there, as you know, you've been in that situation yourself, it, it, I don't know, it, it kind of... There's a better feeling and the good mm. batsman talks to you and, and will help you through and you're looking for it to him for a lead if you're a tailender, aren't you? If you leave tailenders together or lesser batsmen, they get some funny thought processes going on. Oh, yeah. So, drinks. Andrew Fintos flat on his back there. He's uh, loosening up his back. But a bit hot news from Derbyshire. Uh, Geoffrey she came third today. The big dressage tournament. So morale will be reasonable in the Agnew household tonight. Will it? Mm. Well, she you was won't... winning and they went the wrong way or something. Oh, you won't get a rollicking from your wife or anything then? Well, I don't think so. I think morale will be OK. But, um, <laughs> they're quite complicated. These, you get these sort of maps that you have to follow, plans. They're different every week. You just took a wrong turn, apparently. So they'll be third anyway. It's Maybe they should give England one of those well, plans should. before Lords. And they might get the right route to yeah. batting, particularly batting and bowling. More singing, more music. Up there on the uh, on the big screen. It's been a very musical match. I can't remember a match for music like this. It was all over the place at lunchtime. He was down the corner down here, Geoffrey. Well, it was very nice. This was nice. I've enjoyed this week. I mean, it's been it's been it's been good. It's been very very friendly here. Well, it's except been... for the English cricket, yes. Oh well, I'll talk about more. <laughs> I've enjoyed the yes. From a, from, from, a, from a spectacle, from a you know from a work perspective, and from the players and the spectators, I think I've had a good time. I don't think we've had any grumbles at all on the email from people who've come here and not enjoyed it. Which no, is... I've heard that people have enjoyed it yeah. and. Uh... 
I tell you what's been good as well. For, uh, I've heard from the public. I mean, it's a little different for us, but I've heard from the public that you know now they check your bags because of safety and mm. you know all the stuff we have in the world. That people haven't been held up very long. No. So some of the other grounds might take note. I know one or two people. They stop you for autographs and have a little chat, and they're all saying that they've been able to get into the ground quite easily, yes. comfortably. Yeah. No, I'd agree. Now, with that. We've seen at some grounds in places where it takes forever oh, queuing yes. to get your bag search, you know, for security, and it's, it's damned annoying when the public has travelled, some of them, quite a long way to a test mite. They're going to be here about eight hours, then they have to travel home at night. It's pretty off-putting and irritating when you're stuck in a line for about 45 minutes, isn't it? But everybody's talked really well of how they yeah. got into the ground quite quickly. I can't work out that drinks bag. That's five minutes in which nothing's happened. We've had less than an hour's play since lunch. And apparently tea hasn't been moved. It was all very odd, Dad. Where, where, where did that come from? Anyway. I can now continue play. Three slips in a galley. Johnson's continuing. Bowling to Collingwood down the lakeside. He thought about having a little pull at it, then kept his gloves and his bat out of the way. It went past his ribs and into Haddon's gloves. Still those trees rocking around down there along the banks of the Taff. The breeze blowing quite strongly from left to right which uh, would help the uh, spiky haired Mitchell you'd think to uh, swing the ball into Collingwood I don't think he's going to swing it in only Katty Nelson I just think he's going to come on the angle and then more dangerous ball is the one that pitches and leaves the right yeah. under and he goes again bowls outside like the that. off stump a slow ball which uh, dribbled through Collingwood didn't uh, play a shot at it in the end. It's funny because his low arm does make him quite hard to pick up, like like Malinga. Especially a slow ball where he just undercuts it slightly. Mm. I think the batsmen have had a lot of trouble picking up the slow ball. I think he can cut the ball away uh, at pace. Mm. He, he, when his arm is slingy, it sort of cuts the seam. And actually, you watch it. Some occasionally, some of his quicker balls go away. Deceptive, very. Strongly built, dark hair, and he bowls on the leg stump, turned away by Collingwood. It was full, up on the boots, and Collingwood just turned the face of the bat, and there's a man out at deep square leg, 127 for five. Collingwood to 37, so his second run since lunch. And he's had almost an hour's play since then, or I'll take five minutes out for the drinks, but they've been out there at least for nearly an hour. 27 for 5. Peterson out for 8. Strauss 17. Pryor 14. Looked like a, almost a, a quick collapse there, really. But uh, these two came together at uh, 70 for 5. Now 127 for 5. Johnson goes in, bowls to Flint. Off its edge and taken. Taken low down. Flint doesn't want to go, but he's got to. It was beautifully taken by Ponting. Freddie doesn't think he carried, there. does he? No, he doesn't. And the umpire's having a chat, but uh, Ponting saying, yeah, I caught it. it. It looked clean from all this this distance away. But it was pushed across him. Flintoff rather tentatively just offered the bat at it. The ball took the edge. Ponting so good in that position. It was a more of almost an open face of the bat, really. And uh, through it went to the Australian captain. Well, that's out. It's out. Yeah. So it doesn't matter, you see these replays and sometimes they look as if they haven't, but that's out. It's out. But he did, because it went across him, he played with the open face and it kind of slid off the outside face edge sort of thing. And uh, well, it, it's you're always going to get that from the left armers. That's why you've got to try and not play them towards cover. You've got to try and play them a little bit straight, a little bit more back from whence they came. Because theoretically to play a left arm over the wicket bowler like Johnson. You really want to be bringing the bat down from about third slip, and it, 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 that's impossible, yeah. you know. It's just impossible. Fintoff's waiting. I'm not sure who's coming out next. It's going to be Broad or Swan. What's he waiting for? Do you think broad. he's going to go back in? <laughs> I don't think so. Do no? you think he's going to get another knock? I think even on a referral that would well, have been... Well, I, uh, I don't know if we, when you played in our street with the man all cover as wickets, I mean, if you weren't sure, you got a hit to miss run two, didn't you? Next ball, you had a hit for two, or, or you were out. So, I mean, uh, maybe he wants one of them. Fintoff is waiting for Broad to talk to him. He actually spoke to him there for some length of time, actually, as uh, Broad came down the steps and out into the sunshine. Australia four wickets away from a comprehensive victory. And uh, England now down to the lower order. Broad, Swan, and uh, 
And then Panesar. Well, there's two left-handers. There's Broad and there's Panesar to bat. And I think uh, Horitz will find uh, he'll like to have a little uh, bowl of him. And there's Anderson as well. As Jim shouts behind me, mm. he's on the ball. An Australia win coming up, he thinks. So there's three left-handers for the off-spinner. I think you'd like a little bowl at them. I saw how he bowled at Panesar first innings. He played it to mid on and it went straight to slip off the edge, didn't it? Yeah. Actually, that was, a, you know, that was a really good catch. No, he's it a was, fine catcher. Yeah. Ricky Ponting, yeah. top catcher. I couldn't believe that he didn't have a second slip in before when he nicked that no ball off Hilfenhaus. Interesting. Ricky Ponting looked at Flintoff and said, uh, as he said, yeah, mate, I caught it. He looked at him and told us that's exactly what he said to him. And Flintoff turned yeah. his back and walked off. He's a good guy. Yeah, no, he's a good guy. He's a tough competitor. My goodness me. And a good player, but he's a, I think he's a pretty straight guy. 127 for six. Stuart Broad arrives. There's a nice shot to the famous first innings. moment Australia versus South Africa, where that oh, yes. didn't happen. That's one of the most <laughs> famous comments of all time. And he bounced once, wasn't it? Well, it was Ian Chappell actually on a slip off Mike Proctor. In goes Johnson. Bowls to Broad. Oh, oh it's nice to be close. Over W first ball. Not oh. out, says Billy Doctorow. That swung in. It hit him on the boots right in front of the stumps. It, it might just have been swinging too much. That was like Cooks, wasn't it? Yeah. Like, like Cooks, but I'm not sure that was out. I agree with Billy. I'm not sure. Might That's, just have been going leg side that, but oh, it's, it's close. Very close indeed. It was uh, threatening, certainly. On another day, he might have gone there first ball. And the Aussies were up for it, as you can imagine. How does Ricky Ponting appeal so loudly, his mouth so wide, and his gum doesn't fall out? It really is astonishing. But that, looking mm, at that, well... Close, is yeah, that? It's, it's close. close. It's one of them. It's, it's just sitting or just missing, and doesn't matter what the replay says. Johnson again bowls down the leg side. Broad uh, flicks and misses, and uh, that's taken mm. by Haddon. So Johnson makes the breakthrough, 127 for six. The end of Flintoff, who defied Australia for what 23 overs or thereabouts in that stand of 57 now over Collingwood still there on 37 broad yet to score more from Jeffrey and then Henry well, I just finished that famous story when uh, South Africa beat Australia 4-0 Proctor bowls Chapel edges Tiger lands third slip and Chapel says did you catch it Tiger said yes so off he went Brocky came up, he said, I wasn't sure they were that carried. He said, he didn't ask me whether it bounced first. <laughs> oh naughty, dear. Very naughty. 127 for six, and the disappearance of Flintoff really has made it very likely that Australia are going to win. There was just the chance, I suppose, these two, Collingwood and Flintoff, were going to uh, hold on. It's now Horitz who's going to bowl to Collingwood to start with. And Broad, well, his heart in his mouth. In another day, I think he might have been given LBW to the first ball. Mind you, it hit, they're going to hit the outside of the leg stump, so perhaps the umpire was right, I don't know. Here comes Horitz, Ian Collingwood goes back and forces that out to Hughes, coming in off the cover boundary, and they run a single. Um, Australia will be pleased about that. They'll want to get the left-handed Broad in strike. Horitz, oh, we've got a chap coming onto the field. Mercifully, he's fully clothed. Uh, he He's bringing some flag, there are two of them in fact, and uh, the uh, security guards have tackled them both splendidly, but there's no question of nakedness or anything of that sort, and um, the two security guards are dealing with both of them, and the one at Short Midweed is a bit reluctant to go, and the offside is a bit reluctant to go, the one in the crease is, um, well he's been picked up now. And I think both those two gentlemen have seen their last ball of the day. And uh, one or two day glow steward, stewards coming on in those red jackets. And the chap on the offside there is being very silly. He won't go. He's lying on the ground. So now they've three of them have picked him up. Four of them have picked him up. Oh, dear. Why do people... Why are they so silly? I suppose it's alcohol. But um, how childish, how boring, how unnecessary. The chaps with four people is still fighting. Anyway, one is being led into the gap by the score scoreboard. He's gone quite quietly. The other one is lying on the ground now and is still being a damn nuisance. Uh, and so one or two of the other ones are running back, the stewards. And... Um, it is being led off at the moment like the state coach at the coronation, except perhaps just a fraction quicker, and he's gone. Um, and so that's the end of that. Um, 
it'll upset people's concentration, I suppose, or it could do. Anyway, Horitz is going to start uh, bowl the second ball if it's over, and he's going to bowl it to the left-handed Broad. The first time Broad's been down in strike, it's 128 for six, and that single took Collingwood to 38 before we were so rudely interrupted by those two boring trespassers. And um, I think it'll probably cost them a thousand quid each, won't it? Coming out of the ground, it's an expensive pint of bitter, or the last one that tipped them over the edge was an expensive one anyway. <laughs> and um, the ground staff who came on to deal with the two miscreants, they're running back to their respective positions. Uh, Broad has taken guard, is doing some gardening. He's got a slipper gully, a silly point, and a forward short leg around him, and also a short extra cover. And um, the crowd is, I think, not very enthusiastic about those two um, idiots. Anyway, here comes Horitz, round the wicket. Bowls now to Broad. Broad forward, edge of them. He's, oh, it got away. It was in the air. It got away between uh, Slip, uh, Clark, and... Uh, is that Ponting there? Hussey. At, Hussey at second slip, indeed. And uh, I think that was in the air. There was... Um, they were looking very interested. Now it just bounced a fraction, um, a fraction to the left of Slater. So there we are. And now Horitz is back, bowling over the wicket to Collingwood. Broad is off the single, very edgily, 129 for six. Horitz is in, bowls. Collingwood is forward, everything behind it, pushing it back down the pitch there to Horitz. <laughs> Well, it's always, rather, it's always rather a nasty feeling, I think, when you get interruptions like that. It's so unnecessary, it's so childish, it's so boring, and it's, oh, it just make, leaves a rather nasty taste in one's mouth. Horitz bells again, Collingwood comes forward, shoulders, arms, through it goes there to Haddin, who takes it. Haddin's kept very well today, hasn't he? Yeah, he's generally a pretty good keeper. He, I think he has moments where he has lapses in concentration, but uh, he's certainly about, from about four years ago, he's worked hard on his keeping and he's much improved. And Horitz again in, bells to Collingwood, and Collingwood squirts this one away, just back to the square on the offside. Hughes is very quickly to it from deep cover, keeping them to a single. Oh, the Australians are a bit delighted about that. Two more balls, I think. Two more balls in this over, Malcolm, or one? Just the one. So, well, it's a bowl to the left-handed Broad. That's a, a bonus for the Australians. Broad does a bit of uh, determined gardening. The four vultures crouch round the bat, five including Haddon, the keeper. And here is Horitz bowling around the wicket from the taff end. He bowls, Broad comes forward, plays no stroke. And uh, the ball is taken by Haddon, who deftly removes, deftly but unnecessarily removes a bale, which he politely puts back to save umpire Dottrove the trouble. And then he walks to the other end. And uh, Johnson it is who will continue the attack. It's 100. And 30 for uh, six, one to Broad, and 39 to Collingwood. Yeah, Brad Haddon came from uh, ACT originally. Played uh, played a little bit of cricket with them, with the Canberra team when, or the ACT team, when for a little while they were in the one-day competition, and then he moved to to New South Wales. I think he was attracted there, and uh, his keeping in the early days was a bit sloppy. He could always bat. But uh, he then obviously decided, uh, if I'm going to be a really good cricketer, I need to be better with the gloves. He did a lot of work, and he certainly is a much improved wicketkeeper. Well, it's going to be Johnson now to bowl to Collingwood. Three slips to Gully, and third slips a little bit further forward than the others. Johnson is in, left arm round the wicket, bowls. Collingwood pushes down to mid-off. Instinctively thinks an, there might be a single there, but there's not. And... Uh, it, it's probably a bit early to start doing things like this, but uh, the, you could put forward an argument for uh, Broad to take Johnson and Collingwood to take the off-spinner. Broad didn't look comfortable in the couple of balls facing the off-spinner, but, but it's probably a bit early in the day to be thinking that way. Johnson it is now, round the wicket into Collingwood. That was over pitch. Collingwood stares it away, reaching a little bit for it on the offside. And it's Hussey from the gully who goes um, back towards cover point to field. And he had that one covered all the time and there was no way there was a run there. I'm actually surprised they didn't look to run there. You know, it makes you think that perhaps Collingwood's going to take uh, a, the bulk of Johnson's bowling. 
Johnson it is once more, right tall, dark haired, a straight run up to the wicket, he's there now, he bowls it short and Collingwood turns this round the corner and takes a single out there to uh, deep square leg, north, his glasses on the back of his head field and the score goes on now to 131 for six and Collingwood has got 40 of them and now Johnson is going to unleash himself upon uh, Stuart Broad. Stuart Broad, who's not had a particularly happy match with the ball, he's really not fulfilled the function of the third seamer uh, with any, any adequacy. I mean, he's not been tight enough, there was not the control in his bowling that you need from a third seamer. And I would think he'd be very lucky if he um, comes down the pavilion steps at Lord's on Thursday. I think one of Onions, Harmison, either or both, I think, might well be there. Anyway, Johnson is in now to bowl to Broad, two steps in the gully. He's up to the wicket, he bowls, and Broad goes back, plays this out there to uh, uh, Hughes at short extra cover, and there is no run. It's a lovely afternoon, all the Jonas today promising rain whenever, but there's no sign. Well, there was, there was a, a shower, quite a heavy shower at 9, 9.30, but nothing since play began. There's a lot of blue sky, the ground's in bright sunshine, the crowd very much in shirt sleeve order, colourful shirts, orange, magenta, yellow, it's lovely greens. And uh, here is Johnson again, pounding in, he's there, he bowls it short and Broad goes back and gets run through the covers, nice looking stroke, he timed it well, he's going to get two, possibly three, and it's not back, yes they are going to come for the three, which means that... Um, well, there's now quite a chance that if we can get a dot ball from Johnson now, that Broad is going to uh, be facing Horrit. So I don't think there's any plan in action, Ian, at this moment. No, no, they're taking the runs, which is what they've got to do at this stage. I mean, maybe uh, if you're an hour from the end, you could start to think about uh, one guy staying at a certain end. But um, the, the best way that Broad uh, could ensure that he's coming down the steps at Lord's Pavilion would be to bat out this game and save it uh, save it for England. Then he'd give himself a chance of being at Lord's on Thursday. Even yes, even though I suppose his main requirements is a bowler. But here comes Johnson round the wicket, bowls to Collingwood down the leg side, hits him with Collingwood on the pad, and Haddon does very well. Those balls have just flicked the pad and bounce awkwardly, a brutes for wicket keepers. But he got there very well. He had perhaps a bit of luck with the bounce. It's the end of the over. It's 134 for six. Collingwood has uh, 40, and uh, the other end, Broad, has four. Those three runs took him to four, and he's now going to do battle with Horry. Yeah, they're still just uh, just over a hundred in arrears, 105, I think, and uh, they they still need to think about getting that down, get it to uh, or getting into credit, and that then starts to give Australia a few headaches if uh, if England can get into credit. So that's another reason why you need to be taking all the runs. But I still think that Collingwood, wherever possible should be taking as much of Horrocks as, as he can. Horrocks now over the wicket, bowls and um, forward there comes Broad is coming trickling down to the fine leg boundary. They're going for one are they going to come back for the second? Yes they have and uh, it was Hughes from deep backward square leg who got to that one and uh, 136 for six, six now to uh, Broad and Horitz, um, three men close on the offside, and a short leg in, round the wicket, bowls, and Broad just comes forward, that's picked up very quickly there at uh, Silly Point by Ponting. Didn't he? Ponting always, as I say, walks in at, at Silly Point, it's extraordinary, you can't get much closer than you are where he is, but here's Horitz again, in, bowls to Broad, oh, and Broad tries a sort of half sweep, gets an edge, it goes over the outstretched glove of Haddon, Clark chases it down half the way to the boundary and they run a single. That could have gone anywhere. Broad has got seven, it's 137 for six, an interesting piece of improvisation. Yeah, I'm not sure that this situation calls for <laughs> improvisation. They've just put about 20 security guards in front of that stand where the two guys came from. Oh, yes, they have, haven't they? 
Here comes Horitz again. Over the wicket now, bowls to uh, Collingwood. Collingwood plays back. It's picked up at, uh, by Katic at forward short leg, and there is no run. Really a bright blue sky looking over there to our right to the city and on towards the sea. It is lovely, the weather. Horitz in again, bowls. Collingwood forward just running that uh, down on the offside, and Haddin flicks it back with a glove uh, at the stumps. But in fact, Collingwood's feet were there, and it was backed up by Katic on the leg side. With the great, obviously, element of competition, Australia striving all they can to take these last four wickets and to win this first test match. And here comes Horace again, Collingwood forward, picked up by Ponting at uh, Silly Point. It's the end of the over, 137 for six, seven to Broad and 40 to Collingwood. Yeah, Horace is, uh, is definitely troubling Broad a little bit. And I think Broad is worried about the footmarks just outside his off stump. I think also uh, the lower order players are generally a little bit more tempted to do silly things with the spinners. As soon as the ball goes up above the, uh, the eye line, they tend to uh, start to see opportunities to score and get a bit carried away. Although Broad's... You know, a reasonable batsman. It, it shouldn't be such a temptation for him. We've got North coming on now, haven't we? Yeah, Marcus North, yeah. So obviously Ricky Ponting thinks uh, off-spin to Broad is a bit of an opportunity. Well, Marcus North well, won over earlier today and, and took, um, had one boundary hit off it. And uh, he bowled it from this end, the Cathedral Road end, where he's going to run in now. And here he is, round the wicket to Broad. He's up to the wicket now. Broad is forward, pushing this to uh, Hughes at short extra cover. We've got a slip gully and a forward short leg. Those are the close fielders. And um, Marcus North in again, round the wicket. He's there now, he bowls, Broad is forward. And this time it's Katic from short leg who polices the ball down the pitch and then passes it, flicks it sideways to Hughes on the offside. And from then it goes back to the bowler. Uh, we got Clark at first slip and Ponting in the gully. And Collingwood goes down the wicket, has a bit of a word with Broad, stopping on the way back to do some gardening. And uh, Broad settles over his bat, and here comes North again. He's up to the wicket now, he bowls, and uh, um, Broad is forward, and that's squirting that one just a little bit off the inside edge around the corner. A cottage went and picked it up, and then goes to Silly Point, and leaving the short leg position empty. And um, Hughes goes a little bit deeper at extra cover. Shortish extra cover. In comes North again, bowls, forward lunges Broad, and uh, there is no run there. I think that move was because uh, North is getting the ball to curve in a little bit to, uh, to Stuart Broad. And North it is in now. He bowls and Broad is forward, pushing that down just on the onside. Cattage steps gingerly across the pitch in his crash helmet, picks up and returns there uh, to North. And uh, here comes North again, up to the wicket, bowls, and Broad uh, is <laughs> very studiously forward. That one's fielded by Hughes in the offside at cover, and uh, there is no run there. It's the end of the over, 137 for six. Uh, seven to Broad and 40 still uh, to Collingwood. So off spin at, uh, at each end now, and I guess... That's one way that they're going to get uh, quite a bit of off-spin at Broad to ensure that they get plenty of deliveries bowled at him. Although he seemed to be a lot more comfortable in playing uh, Marcus North than he has been against uh, Horace. Yes, indeed. I mean, North was not getting quite the same purchase on the ball, was he? Or bowling it quite so quickly. Lots of ground staff now running all the way around the ground in case of intruders. And Horitz in, bowls to Collingwood. Collingwood plays that from the crease, just pushing it out to Ponting at uh, Silly Point. And there's no run there. And every ball, really, is like a razor blade in this situation. Every ball has wicket written on it, really. As Horitz is in now, he bowled and... Um, Collingwood goes back. You could see his middle stump as he played that. He made room for himself and forced it, but it hit uh, Ponting at Silly Point. 
And now um, Collingwood is waving to the umpire. I don't know whether there's something behind uh, in his vision at the far end. No, all seems well. And it's Horitz once more. He's up to the wicket. He's there now. And Collingwood's forward pads that away. Ponting picks up. And uh, nothing is done. I can't believe that they have red uh, advertising hoardings right behind the bowler's arm. I mean, no good for the batsman and no good for the slips and the keeper. Oh, extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. And here comes um, Horitz again. Collingwood's forward, picked up by Ponting. History repeating itself. And yes, you would have thought they, they would have, or if they had read things there, you would have thought they'd put a cover over them when the bowling was not in, wouldn't you? Some, do something, in here. And uh, Horitz it is, in bursts Collingwood. Collingwood plays this to Cattage at forward short leg, and there's no run. Collingwood at the moment playing Horitz reasonably comfortably, and much more comfortably than obviously than Broad. And Collingwood's the batsman of calibre who could see this one out, but gosh, he's going to need someone at the other end to help him. And it is Horitz once more. He's in, he bowls. Collingwood plays no stroke. Two ball outside the off stump. Not taken uh, cleanly by Haddon, who goes back and bends down behind the stumps and rehearses the situation again. Good to see. End of the over, 137 for six. Seven to Broad, 40 to Collingwood. And after uh, another thought from Ian Chappell, it will be Chris Martin Jenkins. Well, those security guards are um, moving all around the ground now. They're, they're spreading themselves out, either because they, they want to stop uh, more people from running on the ground or they're sensing the end of the match. I'm not sure which. But uh, Collingwood has looked, uh, has looked very, very solid. And he's been the one real... The, the player who's looked as though he's comfortable in playing uh, this survival game. Yep, the one who's grafted has Horitz round the wicket to bowl to Broad, who leaves it alone. It's taken by Haddon. I think he's also the one who's played, you know, he's probably with a, a few restrictions, but basically played his natural style of cricket. Horitz bowls and Broad comes right forward and snuffs out the spin. There's no run. I didn't think that Peterson and Strauss looked to me at the start of play as though they were playing their basic natural game with a, a little bit of restraint. Horrid scan from quite a wide angle to the left-handed Broad who turns it square on the onside and they get a single. Collingwood happy to come. Now, Collingwood always has the virtue of playing it right under his nose, doesn't he? Oh, we're playing it very late. He's, has his backlift got shorter? I mean, it's almost no backlift. It's almost a going forward backlift. I think he's always had a relatively short one. Yeah, but it seems no, as though it's got be. shorter. Even, could yeah. be. Yeah. But he said, I think, last night, it was up to each individual to see it through by themselves and save the game. And uh, some of the batting was pretty inappropriate, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, well, he's, he's certainly living up to... Uh, what he said. 40 not out he is, but more to the point in the circumstances. He's uh, been batting most of the day. When Peterson came in, he came, went out, he came in, he leaves that ball outside the off stump. Or it's bowling from our commentary box end, the Cathedral Road end, over the wicket to the right-hander with three round the bat. And that is short, and is pulled for four. Good quick-footed batting by Collingwood spotted the long hop and dispatched it as he should have done. Plenty of room on the onside to do so. That boundary also has, has brought the uh, arrears down below 100. Yep, and that the, there may come a time when that's significant. But it's a long way yet. 142 for six. Collingwood now 44. It's been there just over three hours. Three hours and about four minutes. Horrid's bells, and that's pushed into the offside. Uh, little drifter, was it, that one? End of the over. Uh, now, look, I'm just, a, I'm just about to give the result of the Grand Prix, but I understand that quite a lot of people like to watch it later and don't want to know the result. So, in auditory terms, please look away now. Stop your ears, uh, and I will tell you who has won the German Grand Prix. Yes, you can start celebrating in Australia. It's Mac Mark Webber. Well done, him. First Grand Prix win in 130 attempts. Jensen Button was fifth. Off pole, eh? 
He was on pole, uh, so he's won from pole position. It's good effort. Okay, we better not say any more about it because they'll oh, be wondering oh, yeah. when he come back. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got the hint, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have uh, spin at both ends, are we? Yeah, Horrocks at the far end and uh, North at this end. You, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I, th I think I'd said that it was Horrocks. Um, and it is, it, he's not allowed to bow at both ends. No, Warwick Armstrong was the only one who did that, I think. He did? No, actually, there was <laughs> another guy. He did it deliberately, I think. Yes, he? he did, but another guy did it in 1951, because I always thought he was the only one. In fact, it was a New Zealand guy, I think, in about 1951. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Here's Horridge anyway, coming in round the wicket to the left-handed Broad, who plays short of mid-on and sets off on a run. Broad could do himself a lot of good with, uh, well, it hardly goes without saying, with a really long innings here, a saving innings here, but a really substantial one, because he's in the side partly for his batting, and his bowling, it has to be so, was very disappointing. 143 for six. He's made nine so far. Or it's coming over the wicket for the right-hander. From the River Taff end, it trips in and gives a nice bit of curving flight and is pushed into the offside. That wasn't smart cricket by Australia, allowing that single early in the over. Peter Siddle at mid-on really yeah, should have been slow, yeah. on the ball. Yeah. Or it's Buzz and uh, Collingwood forward two reasons really obviously uh, he wants to bowl at the newer batsman but also off spinners like bowling at left handers however there are four round the bat for Collingwood Horitz comes in from that far end and bowls to him and Collingwood goes back to a flighted delivery plays it firmly into the ground it's very well stopped by Ponting at silly mid off Ponting took a superb slip catch to make the breakthrough that Australia wanted after a bit of resistance from Flintoff and Collingwood. Flintoff had to go for 26, caught low at second slip off Johnson. Here we are, Christopher, uh, at the Basin, 1950-51, New Zealand versus England. A.A. A. Moyer emulated W.W. Armstrong by bowling consec consecutive overs. Up comes Horitz, and that's pushed defensively. I don't know what the circumstances were, do you? I remember Moyer, he was useful, seam bowler. Dark hair, as I recall. Uh, who was the New Zealand skipper? It was Walter Hadley. You wouldn't have thought he was mischievous, would you? No, definitely not. Just a mistake, perhaps. In comes Horridge. From round the wicket to the right-handed Collingwood, played into the offside, and fielded at cover by Hughes, no run, 143 for six. Broad nine and Collingwood 44, very well remembered him. Here we go, uh, he bowled the last over before tea on the fourth day and the first over afterwards, so he probably... Uh, Who are the umps? Who are the guilty umps? <laughs> McClellan and Pengelly. A couple of New Zealanders, mate. Perhaps he'd only just arrived from, <laughs> only just arrived from Cornwall, Mr Pengelly. Oh, no, go easy on the... Bit of jet lag. On the uh, Cornish lads, mate. I'm, uh, that's my yeah. ancestors. Really? Illuggan, yep. Mm. Where? Illuggan. It's uh, not far from Red Ruth, I think, or somewhere down that way. Right. No. Uh, I'll have a test ground there soon. <laughs> Up comes North with his off breaks and bows to the left-handed broad who pushes to sit him it off. Three men round the bat on the offside for North. On the leg side, he's got a mid-on who significantly is uh, stopping the one properly. Johnson is almost level with the stumps as he bowls just outside the off stump. No appreciable turn there, left alone by Broad. And the square leg is now coming in tighter to save the one, two. Unless he's just coming for a chat with the umpire. He's come a bit closer and, and fine leg also saving one. Possibly in comes North, bows to Broad, who plays a nice flowing off drive, but only as far as mid off. Three close fielders and a little arc from slip to silly mid off. 
North with a nice action, bows outside the off stump. But uh, I really should have spotted it. It was North and not Hilton House, uh, not um, Horrid's brother. Yeah, he has got a nice action. He, he seems to be curving the ball in more than spinning it away. Yes. Round the wicket, he's bowling to the left-hander who comes right forward and uh, head over the ball, blocks it. Stuart Broad went to Oakham School where the present groundsman here at Glamorgan, who's only been here less than a year, was the groundsman and uh, he produced some belting pitches there. Up comes North and Broad goes forward and Broad initially at that school was more of a batsman than a bowler. So like father, like son, but um, he'll need all that cricketing education today. Yeah, as we were saying earlier, it, um, it won't do his chances any harm of playing at Lords if he can uh, see this out for, and save the Test match for England. But that last delivery from Marcus North, he went a bit more uh, round arm, just trying to get a bit of variation. It, Broad seems to be much more comfortable facing North than when he's up against uh, Horace. Yeah, which rather emphasises the point I think you made before the match that they jolly well should have been, having picked one specialist spinner in this party, they should have been playing him and not thinking of part-time spinners. No, part-time spinners, it's, it's, it's a rubbish theory. I mean, Australia have been saying for a while, you know, you can get away with it, but they tried it in India and it, it failed horribly over there and, and I just don't think it's going to work. You might, you might get lucky every now and again, but not too often. Or it's from the River N, round the wicket to Collingwood, who's opened out his stance to meet the new angle, and he just blocks that. In India, for example, they would never dream of playing a, a part-time all-rounder spinners. I'm sure they wouldn't. They might have done it with seamers in the old days, but um, they just believe to, in specialists. Just to take the shine off the ball. Yeah. There's Horrocks bowling to Collingwood, who must be aware of playing on here. He's playing the ball very late and with such little back lift that he's just stopping it, and it, several times it's run back off the face of his bat towards the stumps. There are two slips and two short legs. He bowls to Collingwood, who this time goes back and plays to mid-on. No run. Clark and um, Ponting are the slips. Pitch is looking very, very flat, um, and the Australians got a bit of life out of it early on, but I, I guess something to do with the ball going a bit softer. Mm. Yeah, Flintoff, when he was there, it was looking pretty flat. Up again comes Horrids, and it's played to second slip. It was exactly as everybody predicted the pitch would be, really. Yeah. Very slow, very flat. I mean, taking a little bit of slow turn. Yeah, when you, I mean, when you look at it playing like this, you, you think to yourself, well, England should be able to survive the last day, really. But they've lost six wickets, Hurrits, Bells, and a nice bit of adjustment of the feet by Collingwood to turn that ball on his leg stump to hussy it back with short leg. Philip Hughes won't be pleasing the captain. Ricky Ponding has had to call him to bring him up uh, to point to save the single and try and keep... Uh, Collingwood away from the strike. He's had, he had to do that a couple of times, so that won't please the captain. No, he should have worked it out for himself, but he's only young. In comes Horitz and Bells to uh, Collingwood. I think almost the worst moment for England in this match, uh, sorry, you may be going off to telly, it was when Anderson failed to get behind the stumps uh, to, to take a return through. I mean, if, if you can't, you know, obey the absolute basics of a game like that, a lot of a lot of bowlers do it now, though. They don't get back behind the stumps. And, but Anderson's was a big blunder because they had a real chance of getting a run out on that occasion. So it, it always shows up a bit more when when there is a big a run out opportunity. Mm. The all off spin attack is going to continue. Zine goes off to other duties. With two spinners bowling, of course the overs get through quicker. I've been. Uh, Wanting to tell you a little bit about the latest developments in the West Indies, which I will, if I can. North run the wicket, bowls to Broad, who gets right over the top of that and plays it defensively. The West Indies board has upped the ante in its ongoing clash with its own players by issuing a media release stating its unswerving commitment to the current squad. Here's North uh, bowling almost a full toss to Broad, right up in the block hole, and he blocks it. 
the current squad, in other words, being um, those playing Bangladesh. And to all those who've made themselves available, it says, for selection as North Bells and Broad is beaten for the first time by just a sufficient degree of spin from North to beat the outside edge. Good length, too, and he went forward to it, and it uh, could easily have just brushed the glove there. So the board said that the s squad for the S Champions Trophy in September would be picked from among these players and that it would begin interviewing prospective captains. So it's all out civil war at the moment and comes North, I'm sure enjoying it, like all part-time bowlers, but uh, at the moment Broad dealing with it fairly capably. No run as he goes forward again. Lovely sunshine at Sapphire Gardens. A light breeze, or quite a strong breeze actually, as uh, he bowls at another ball that turns a little bit. Broad wasn't playing at that one. And he left it for Haddon. And Jimmy Adams is now the on the secretary of the Players Association, so he's putting the point of view of the players. But the, the uh, here goes North again, a bit more round. I'm trying to bowl it a bit quicker this time. Capably played by the left-handed Broad, who is nine not out. It's 143 for six in England today. Have lost Peterson, bowled Helfenhaus eight, Strauss caught Haddon, bowled Horitz 17. Prior caught Clark, bowled Horrocks, 14, and Flintoff caught Ponting, bowled Johnson, 26. And there are plenty of overs left for Australia to finish the job they've begun so well. Still 45 overs, 30 until the second new ball, if England managed to get that far. And then there'll be, if they do, there would be 15 overs for <clears throat> Australia with a harder, bouncier ball. Victory, join me. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, in one sense, England haven't done so badly since lunch, I suppose, in that they've only lost a one wicket, but they just haven't got any to spare. Collingwood is doing a grand job, but in a totally passive mode. He seems to be able to function like that, but I'm not sure the people at the other end can cope with such slow progress. There's Horwich tripping in to bowl to Collingwood, who goes back and just stops it in front of me of him. He scored nine runs, Collingwood, in this session. Yeah, but he well, has batted. He's, he's got his priorities right, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, I know that runs scored might make Australia bat again, but but if England can't win, they've got to bat out the day if they possibly can. Horitz comes in and Collingwood drew back as if tempted to square cut at that. There's a man out of deep cover anyway and it was a bit too far up for the cut and wisely he left it alone. I mean his pri priorities are much better in this situation than in Adelaide. Yes. Um, yes. Well yes. those two years ago. Yes then he was just a bit too statuesque in comes Horrids and Bills. Something different floated up just outside the leg stump this time and um, in other circumstances, Collingwood, I'm sure, would have danced down and hit that through mid-wicket, but he left it for Haddin, who took a rather awkward one to take very well. Sun glints on the back of Michael Clark's sunglasses at slip. He's got blue glinting ones stuck behind his baggy green. He returns the ball to Nathan Horrids, who's a much happier bunny than he was three days ago, four days ago, long time test matches, or it's tripped in again, but it's a little bit wider and invites the drive, very fine stop by Ponting at Silly Point, fearless there, there's a firm drive off the middle, he's only about three yards from uh, Collingwood's batter, oh well, <laughs> it actually hit him on the shin, but uh, anyway, he got, the, he got the body behind it. Horitz bows a little bit short, and that's hit for four. Collingwood wheeling round, pulled it, just for a moment I thought short leg might have topped that one, as the Australians say, but no, he pulled it along the ground to square leg, and Collingwood has gone to 48 in England to 147 for six. Well, he waited for that. It wasn't that short, but it was quite slow. He judged the length, and having been denied four, perhaps, from the previous ball, 
when it hit. Um, Ponting, silly point, he's got his four there. Ponting's had enough of this all spin attack, he's taking North off. And Peter Siddle is going to come and have a bowl. That makes sense. I think so, I think keep juggling it around. But um, uh, just under, just over 20 minutes to go until tea, which is half an hour later than normal. Uh, well, I think it's the uh, tea's at 4.10. Oh, now, what are we talking it? about? Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry, yes. So 50 yeah, minutes till tea. Normal would be, yes, so, yeah. <clears throat> but a long way away from the new ball, no way. Siddle won't get it first, presumably. At New Road, in the women's one-off test match, uh, Australia, as you remember, made 309, and England are 224 for nine. So, um, a, a more even yes. game, but Australia is still on top. Beth Morgan made 58. And there's commentary on that on Five Live Sports Extra tomorrow from 10.45. So, Siddle, the honest up-and-atom bowler, strongly built for hard work with a sweatband on either forearm as opposed to wrist. He's going to bowl with three fairly well-spread slips and a gully, a cover and a mid-off, a mid-on, a man just in front of the umpire, saving one and a long leg. And he's bowling to Stuart Broad, who's nine not out. He runs in both round the wicket to him and Broad playing it a wee bit late. Just got everything into the right area in time and pushed it out to mid-off. <coughs> Bread of heaven. Not quite so... Um, it's not quite the Millennium Stadium, is no, it? No, I was going to say. <laughs> quite the conviction on certain other occasions. But a uh, little burst. Went round the ground. Siddle, tall, fair-haired. Bells from very wide of the crease to Broad, who comes forward and misses. Just the angle defeated him there, I think. Broad, in, in figure, to me, he always looks a bit more like David Gower than he does his own father, Chris. He's still quite willowy. As Henry would say, do you know what I mean? <laughs> he doesn't yet play like David Gower, but he's doing OK. Siddle burst him, and he lets that go by outside the off stump. David Gower writing in his newspaper column today about flair players having to... Um, hold themselves back and go for the long innings and certainly England if as is probable still they lose this match must reflect on their carelessness on the first day too many players getting in and getting themselves out Siddle goes in and bright sunshine he bowls to Broad and pushes into the offside they'll get a run at least just the one into the extra cover gap to take Broad into double figures and England to 148 for six. Crowd enjoying themselves, haven't had many runs to chair. So rival singing groups I think are hurling good nature of abuse at one yes. another. Collingwood now takes guard against Siddle, whom he hasn't seen for some hours. Running in towards him, but he goes now. Passed up by Doctorove and bowls over the wicket to Collingwood, who gets very suspiciously up onto his toes as though that was going to rear up to head height, but it would take some doing on this pitch with an old ball. And he played it safely enough in the end in front of his chest, or perhaps his solar plexus. Just the one wicket so far for Australia in this session. But England yet to score 50 runs. <coughs> Siddle with a very straight approach. Bell's on a fuller length this time and Collingwood plays him into the ground. 
sort of stops it off his own bowling. Parrying it with his right hand. Drinks coming on. Second drinks interval of this session, which is a longer one because of the rain yesterday and therefore the extra eight overs today in the day's fair, taking it to 98 overs minimum. And it may be minimum there. Australia will... There may come a time in a way when they're very keen to get the new ball as early as possible, but they can't take it until 80 overs have been bowled. 148 for six. I think you've got a, something you're reading intently, and I'll let you share it with your listener and uh, with um, Jim Maxwell. Well, we've got an email from Jeff Richardson. I reckon he's going to be Welsh, but I don't know. Anyway, he says, for months now, Everyone's been asking the wrong questions. Oh. Is Cardiff up to hosting a test match? Will Cardiff put on a good show? Will the Welsh fans show their support for England? The question everyone should have been asking is, will England put on a good show for Cardiff? They haven't, and Cardiff is disappointed. Should have picked more Welshmen in the team, eh? Name them. <laughs> um, Don Shepherd. <laughs> uh, Robert Croft. <laughs> Robert Croft, yes. <laughs> well, we're drifting along here at a drinks break, and the score is whatever it is, 6 for 148. Didn't we have this one last night? Name the greatest Welsh cricketer. Who would be the greatest Welsh cricketer? Well, I don't know. Some people might say Don Shepherd. Don Shepherd, probably. Um, but there have been others who have played for England. Yes, uh, the Jones, Jones, father and son, Jones obviously. Played, well, and, the, 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 and the batsman, Alan well, Jones. Well, Alan Jones played... Uh, it's always a matter of debate. I have to look to Mal Malcolm um, about Alan Jones, who played against the rest of the world. Mm. There's always been debate as to whether that qualifies as a test cap. Uh, uh, Malcolm says no. Uh, Tony Lewis, of course, captained England. Yes. Um, but whether... Oh, I'm not going to tread on too many Welsh toes to decide who was a greater player, Alan Jones or Tony Lewis. Um, they, they marvel about Alan Jones here in the way they marvel about Don Shepherd and see it as a conspiracy, a London-based conspiracy that neither um, played much. I, I, I was too young to play against Shep, although I was lucky enough to keep meeting him on trips to Cardiff. did play against Alan Jones, who was a fleet-footed opening batsman who played in WA. Played for West Australia for one, one season, for sure. Quite a long time ago, but he did. I, yeah. I, 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 and a beautiful and there's, player. And there's Jeff Jones and Simon Jones. And yeah. There's Robert, John, Robert, Jones everywhere. Robert Croft, Geraint yeah. Jones. <laughs> yes. Oh, Geraint Jones of Papua New Guinea, Australia and Wales. <laughs> the very same. The very same. After drinks, here comes Horrocks and he bowls to Broader. No ball, which sneaks down the leg side and um, what's the indication? Did he get some bat on it? No, he didn't. So it'll go down as two no balls. Whilst there's um, this break we've just had, um, there's a chance to mention also that there's a test match special Ashes archive, and you can hear the great moments of Ashes history going back to 1932, and you can find it on www.bbc.co.uk slash Ashes archive. That's worth a listen. So dip into it when you've got a moment. We might be here for a while, though. Collingwood's uh, dug in for the rest of the day from the look of it as he pushes forward to Horace. The, the ball's soft now. Nothing much is happening. And Australia will be starting to look at the, the board and think, mm, new ball due and another 17 overs. But um, Collingwood's playing with great organisation and skill, and he's going back and playing on the bump to Cadditch, who knocks it down with his right hand in at short leg. They're almost giving Collingwood one. I mean, they've got the three men round the bat, slip, three point forward short leg, and the rest of the field has been told to go deeper so that he can take a single and put Broad on strike. I would think he'll take it too. I wouldn't blame him for taking it. Horrocks tosses, forward goes Collingwood. There's a single if they want it, they don't. Mm -hmm. he just well, he decided to... He wasn't rest. deep enough. I don't think the mid-on was quite deep mm -hmm. enough to ensure the, uh, the safe passage, perhaps. I don't know. I don't know, unless he's saying, I'll take him. Horrocks has become... What a flattering moment for Horrocks. 
Yes, five wickets in the match. Two useful ones today. He bowls again and Collingwood stabs forward. Doesn't look pretty, but is very effective. Now they'll come in a bit closer because there's uh, one or two left in the over. Two to go, so the one savers are up. Um, they're right. Yes, the no ball, so that's right. No ball down the leg side. Six for 150. Collingwood 48, broad 10. Here's Horitz coming up into the breeze. Bowls wide and another no ball. I never understood it. How many no balls did you bowl in your career? I don't know, but I mean, it happened. Uh, mm. Two or three a year, I'd say. Two or three a summer. And he's, he's bowled quite a few yeah, in this yeah. game. And uh, he ripped that wide of the off stump, so he's still got two to go. Comes up to Collingwood. Collingwood full and wide. Not interested. He's, he's bowling with the intent of a man who just wants to make sure Collingwood doesn't score a run. Um, maybe it's time actually to go the other way and just tempt him with something. Or try, try and really rip one for a bat pad. Horace comes in, bowls to Collingwood. Collingwood digs it out in front of... Uh, Ponting, who takes it in at a short point, selling it off to end the over. Six for 151, and Broad will be facing, with Peter Siddle trying to get some swing, some reverse movement, and with this older ball coming in from the Cathedral Road end. Today, Peterson bowled Hilton House eight. Strauss caught Haddon bowled Horrocks 17. Prior caught by Clark at slip off Horrocks for 14 since lunch. Flintoff caught by Ponting low down at second slip of Mitchell Johnson for 26. Yep, well, it's. You can see why you would have predicted a draw in this match having watched the first couple of days. I mean, the pitch is still behaving pretty well. There is some turn for Horrocks, but it's pretty slow. As the ball gets older as well. There's a little bit of movement for the quicker bowlers in the air once they get a reverse swing going, but it's not prodigious, and the Knicks struggle to carry. Siddle around the wicket, broad forward, good defence, sending the ball down towards mid-off. Siddle's just looking like he might tail a bit in, or if he can maybe get it to hold its line, he could hit the edge, but as you say, if you're just pushing at the ball, it's well, going to struggle Flint to carry. Yeah, well, Flintoff got it to carry, of course, just. Um, off Johnson, Off yes. Johnson. Mm. Just. Yeah. They are standing in a bit at second yeah, and, well, and, quite right too. and fourth slip. Good catch that, wasn't it? Doesn't miss too many. Beautiful hands. Siddle bowls. Back goes broad. Hit on the pad. A leg by here with no one at home. Square of the wicket. Haddon has it. Hurl at the stumps at the non-strikers end, and Billy Doc drove almost elegantly, raises his leg. Six for 152. It was quite an unusual moment in modern test cricket, Flintoff's dismissal, isn't it? <laughs> in so far as the ball was nicked, it carried to Ponting. It only just carried, there was doubt in the batsman's mind, but instead of looking to umpire, third umpire, he looked to the fielder, mm. who I think indicated that he had caught it, and then after another little pause, Flintoff walked off. Doesn't happen very often nowadays, does it? Well, no, but particularly <laughs> as... Um, well, I, you know, I think Ricky Ponting's tried in a few series to come up with a, a pact with the opposing captain. Mm. You know, if, if we say we've caught it, you say you've caught it, off you go. But not all the other captains have, have agreed and said, no, let's leave it in the hands of the umpires. But that's why it was good to see that. Yeah. Yeah, very good. And he caught... And we, then we studied the replays and you know from experience how these replays can sometimes make the legitimate catch look extremely dodgy. Um, we saw the replay and it, it was fine, mm. of course. Now Ponting's just doing a bit of manoeuvring here for Collingwood. He's going to try something different because of the slow pitch and the fact that the ball's not really looking like it's going to do much if it hits the edge. And even that's difficult. He's going for a slip gully, a silly point, silly mid-off and a short mid-wicket and down the leg side he's played away by Collingwood towards fine leg for a run, is that a leg by it or off the bat, looked like it came from the pad, yes it did, it's another sundry, six for 153 and Broad's immediately back on strike after all those manoeuvrings in the field to set something up.
And we've got T uh, has been pushed back because of all the overs required today. It's a 98 over day if we go the distance. And at the moment, there's something like another 42 to come after this. Now around the wicket, Siddle bowls short. It's edge just in front of Ponting at second slip. It didn't carry. And that's what uh, the Australians would have been concerned about. Ponting did his level best to get his hands under it, but it was just tantalisingly in front of him as Broad sparred at the ball and it landed only just in front, a couple of inches perhaps in front of Ponting's attempt to get under it. Yeah, it's a, it's a bad shot. He's been playing very, very passively broad, and it was not a great ball, really, one that you'd expect him to try and square cut in normal circumstances. Broad's 10, Siddle bowls. He's leaving outside the off stump, taking care as he parried at that previous delivery. So he's poking away at the pitch. He's a, a batsman of some lower order potential. But uh, he went very close to being dismissed. Is Ponting going to move in a little bit closer? He may as well down at that end. We've seen a lot of edges die in front of field. Well, the edges that there have been. Here comes Siddle again around the wicket. Bowls of all his edge for four. Wide of Hughes at fourth slip and down to the boundary. It flies away across the turf. More supportive applause from the crowd here. Stuart Broad to 14, 6 for 157. I might just have a look at those bowling figures, Malcolm, um, as we get to the end of the over, over from Siddle. Nine overs, one maiden, none for 27. Johnson, 16 overs, four maidens, two for 27. Hilfenhaus, who got the big breakthrough, 11 overs, two maidens, two for 36. Horrocks, 20 overs, six maidens, two for 40. And a bit of occasional Clark, three overs for eight, and North, five overs, three maidens, none for nine. Well, a moral victory there for Siddle. He, he, he's full of energy. He's trying just to get the ball to move away from the left-handed ball from around the wicket. And he found the outside edge twice there. The first one didn't carry to Ponting. The second one, we went along the ground, uh, but through that slip cordon quite quickly. Mm. Bonus four runs for Broad, 157. For six, still quite a long way for England before they can get to parity. They're fighting hard. Ben Hilfenhaus is waving his arms around there, either, either suggesting he's ready to bowl or he's been getting a message that he might. But um, we're 16 overs away from a new ball, if required. And Horrocks is going to bowl with slip, gully, short leg and a leg slip Collingwood waits Collingwood goes back and thinks of a single but it uh, travels quickly towards Siddle down at mid off big gap on the offside there's just a mid off and then a deep point mid on straightish mid wicket deep backward square but four around the bat Horrocks comes in Collingwood pushes away just waiting for the ball he's he's got the pace of the pitch and the measure of the bowling to a large extent as the ball's got softer, Horrocks has found it harder to really get one to grip and bounce. But uh, he might just find a spot there to cause some consternation. He's searching, probing away. He bowls to Collingwood, who's forward, using the pad that time, played inside the ball as he threw out his uh, left leg. Six for 157. Collingwood full of patience, obduracy here. He's added 13 runs in two hours since lunch, but he's still there. Horrocks bowls. He goes back and he turns through the infield. Broad goes late, but gets there. As a, there's a chance of an overthrow with uh, Hussey repairing back and throwing past Haddon. One more for Collingwood. 49. And this is what Hor Horrocks wants. He wants to get Broad on strike. One of his first strokes or scoring strokes was a snick between Clark and Hussey in the slips so I think he'd be hoping for something like that to happen again another discussion 
collective between Broad and Collingwood. He's just uh, done a bit of gardening, Broad, halfway down the pitch. Now, uh, Horace is, is bowling well. He's not going to land the ball within about 10 feet of where he's just been doing the gardening. The keeper in five near the bat, and Broad forward, shuffling, pushing, keeping the ball down out of harm's way towards Katic, who's in there at short leg. Yes, sir. A uh, leg slip, short leg, silly point, and two slips. Oh, it's, it's just got a little bit of a, a breeze coming in from backward point. And goes in, forward comes broad, plays it well. On the bounce, straight to the alert, Ricky Ponting, under the nose on the offside. Six for 158. Broad's 14, Collingwood's 49, and Siddle's coming up for another over. This is the point where we'd be uh, heading off for tea after this over, but uh, we'll be going on to ten past four local time before that. Yeah, well, he's battling away, Stuart Broad. He's had a disappointing game, certainly with the ball, uh, and produced just a little cameo with the bat in the first innings, but he'd love to have a proper impact on this match right at the end. Uh, he likes a fight. He's looking a little bit cumbersome, if you like, against Horitz, but he's still there. There's a silly mid-off, a siddle bowls, and that swings, hits the pad and appeal for LBW. Umpire Dockro says, not out. They look to be going down. There was certainly some movement, maybe some bounce as well, but uh, Peter Siddle was very keen from where he was following through. It looked plumb, but uh, from where umpire Doctrobe was looking, it seemed to be going down the leg side. And I think he got it right there, umpire Doctrobe, but he beat the bat. Uh, and there's no point appealing half-heartedly. It actually came back into mm. Collingwood. I think it would just about miss leg stump. It's, it's a fair decision. He bowls again outside the off stump and a little fiddle from Collingwood. And they've lost the concentration and the ball kept low. The danger there is you'll chop it into your stumps if uh, you're not taking care. But old Hawkeye saying it was uh, just clipping well, the top just, of leg stump. Just but... clipping the top of it. Oh, yeah. Yes, well. Uh, it's, he's just got a bit of rhythm, I think, Siddle. Yeah. He's hurrying Collingwood. He hasn't played the last two balls well. Even when the ball's a bit old, this fellow will be running in and letting it fly. He's coming in now, he bowls at Collingwood, he's watching the ball very carefully. Still just getting in on the pads. Interesting feel, isn't it? They've got the uh, sil silly mid off. Is, is that for a little bit of bat pad opportunity? And then the onside, if the ball holds, I suppose, off the pitch, he could poke Yeah, well, the, the, the silly mid off, or silly point almost, is also to try to stop. Collingwood lurching forward mm. because you can't, could easily get a little inside edge onto the pad popping up on the offside. So to keep him back. Keep him on the crease for the LBW. Yeah. Siddle comes in and bowls a bouncer and he falls over after delivering it. He did a spectacular tumble in his follow through. He's picked himself up very quickly. Seems to be all right. He gets a, a, a pat on the rump from Ricky Ponting to encourage him, encourage him but the surprised Collingwood and it, it didn't bounce very high. Nope. Just went over his left arm and through to the keeper. He's having it. This is a tough over. He, did, he, he didn't really see the funny side of falling over, I don't think. Peter the crowd Siddle. have seen it three times now. Yeah. Oh, once, yeah. once live and twice on replay. Yes. <laughs> so three men on the onside in catching positions close in as he's forward to a pitched up delivery and no ball. And a, sp a spate of no balls, really, from Australia today. How many is that, Malcolm? Because uh, it'll push the bowling of the 98th over if it happens out to fairly late in the day. How many have we had? We've actually had nine no balls in total. Total up to 11, given the, yes. the buys off the two. But nine delivered. Correct. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, you know, more than an over to add on. So there's a short mid-off, a short mid-wicket, and a man in front of square close. And Siddle Bowles pitches up and he takes the slanting inward movement away towards that fella who's just out there in, uh, in front of Square. Six for 159 at the moment. Collingwood lurching along on 49. Watching the ball very carefully. And Siddle is getting the ball 
to move in at him with Kadic right in under the nose on the offside. It's a very tense scene as Collingwood works hard to keep up his concentration. Siddle comes in, bowls to him, that swung in again. He was forward and playing it on the bounce straight to Katic, who's nearby. So it's the end of the over. Jeffrey Boycott's back. Six for 159, and those that have played their, played their 25 pounds to come in today, they're getting their money's worth. I think it's one of the few good ideas the uh, authorities that run our game have done. Mm. You know, charging people a small amount, and if there's no cricket, you don't get your money back. Um, from the cricket point of view, I suspect that the crowd just beginning to think that there might be a chance England will save the day after the disappointment of early on. And I think the players think so too. And you can sense from the Australians there's just a little bit of irritation. They know that T's in uh, oh, 20 minutes or more, 25 minutes, and then they've got they've got the second new ball up their sleeve. But then uh, after T, you get into the realms of. As Horace you... starts a new over, Broad lets it by, and uh, just in between deliveries while you continue. Yeah. Jonathan Agnew is coming in. Yeah, and, and they, I think after T, you know, if England is still six down, you start to see the finishing post as a batting side. You, you do have a two hour, two and a half hour spell. Horace brought forward and finds a man just catching in front in the offside there. There's five men around the bat at the moment. Three in the offside at Slip Gully and uh, man just in front. It's Ponting staring into Broad's eyes. And then uh, leg slip and uh, a backward, or just in front actually now, his short leg. Up comes Horrocks. Bowls, Broad is forward and uh, Haddon, the wee keeper, stretches out. One of those green and gold gloves of his. And uh, there's no run. 159 for six. Lovely afternoon. Blue skies, sun shining. Feels like a batting day, really. It's quite fresh. And England uh, trying to hang on. They're still 80 behind. They've got four wickets left. Swan, Anderson and Panis up. Horrocks, round the wicket. Bowls. Oh, it's curry through. He's out, LBW. It came scooting through. Broad again takes a bit of time to go. But the finger was up very quickly indeed. And Nathan Horrocks has been buried underneath all of his teammates, all round him now, slapping on the back. That really is a big wicket for Australia. And it just turned a little, hit him round about the knee roll, pretty much in front. It's, a, it's quite a difficult replay to see, though, that we've seen there to line it all up. This is a better one. Broad going back, ball turned, it pitched on, hit him up on the roll, cheerio, that's out. I think that was missing leg. Missing off and hitting middle about halfway up. I think you're right, Jeffrey. Yeah, I mean, that was another shot played towards mid-wicket instead of played straight. But it was clever bowling. Give the man his due. He just bowled that a little bit quicker. He definitely did bowl it a little bit quicker. I mean, I'm one of those, I don't think he's a great off-spinner looking at people. Ashley Mallet in the past, look at the great Jim Lake and that. But the lad has done well and give him full credit. He deserved the wicket. He just deceived Broad. I know he's not a great batsman or anything, but he can bat. He got the wicket that matters because he, he, he's been prepared to... I hate the word, what is it? Not experiment, but he, he, he's altered his flight and his pace, hasn't he? More than the uh, England spinner, shall we say. And when he's altered it, he's still kept a reasonable line and length. To some degree, I know the England batsmen have helped and allowed him to. They've not taken runs off him. They're just in a blocking situation. But at the same time, full credit, the lad did just uh, vary his pace there and got the wicket. I think Broad should have been forward to that slow pitch. Oh, wow. Gosh, he just should have, should have smothered that, but uh, he was back. Graham Swan uh, walks out to bat. Might feel that he owes England a bit after uh, the bowling of yesterday. He and Panis are between them. You Leicester fast bowlers, you never could bat, could you? No. Nope. <laughs> Never pretended I could, Geoffrey. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to get that one in a little and Never stir pretended it. I could. No. I could block a bit in a, in a situation like this. Do you know the worst thing about your batting was? So. You didn't look like you could bat when you came out. No. <laughs> I always thought I was going to hoodwink the fast bowlers to be kind, but it didn't often work. It never looked as if you could bat. Hawkeye has broad hitting middle stump. Yeah. You couldn't even deceive us into making us think you could bat when no, you walked out. Didn't really want to. <laughs> 159 for seven. Swan's first ball. In comes Horrocks. He bowls to him and they're just bouncing into the leg side. Four men around the bat at the moment, just bouncing in front of Katic. 
There's a man also at short mid-wicket at uh, oh, 12 yards from the bat. Mid-off, backward point. Down they all go, those close fielders. Horrocks comes in, bowls over the wicket, tossing it up outside the off stump. Swan lets it go by, and the one thing that Swan will not want to do is to get out to his opposite number. Spinners do not like that at all. And people used to talk about a fast bowlers club, which of course disappeared a long time ago with bouncers and so on, but there is certainly no club as far as spinners are concerned. You do not get out to your opposition. Nope. Well, he's got six wickets in the match, that Horitz. Yeah. <laughs> he's got three in each in his so far, and he's got to bowl at Monty Panasa to come and Anders and two more left-handers if they can get through one of these right-handers. Well, Brawl wandered off with a rather accusing look at the umpire, shaking his head, but I'm afraid. Stuart, yeah, look at the replay. The old son and... Uh... Oh, it's plumb. Yeah. Halfway up, two-thirds way up. I don't think much difficulty. I mean, I, I, I don't disagree with umpires making quick decisions. I mean, some decisions, they're, they're so easy and yeah. plumb, aren't they? I mean, why should you take your time? It's some you do have to just take a second. Siddle runs in and bowls to Collingwood. Full, little reverse swing there, tucked away into the leg side for a very hard fought 50. And he's worked very hard for that. Been very patient since lunch. He was on 35 over two hours ago. He's reached his second half century of the game, his 15th in all. And he's getting a shake of the hand there from Graham Swan, but uh, it's not the half century that matters here for Collingwood. Although he'll be enjoying the applause that uh, he knows as he rests on his bat. He only brandished it quite quickly. He's got uh, a lot of hard work still ahead of him. Well, he's made an effort to do the right thing, hasn't he? Yep. Stay in. Yep. That's full credit to him. 167 balls he's faced, about for 232 minutes. But it's down to him, really, with the support from what's left. Swan, as we know, can bat. It's not a huge amount to come after that. 160 for seven. 79 behind. Australia could still win this match by an innings. And it's now Swan with two slips, a gully, a short leg and a backward short leg who waits for Siddle, who runs in, bowls a bouncer to him, which was flying over his back. He well, took his eye off it, but uh, he had it all pretty much lined up. It flew over his back and uh, into Haddon's gloves. So two slips, a gully. One in the offside, saving the single. Then we have another of these very short, straight mid-ons. Forward short leg, leg slip. A man out, well, curiously placed. He's neither deep, well, he's neither deep or in. He's not mid-wicket or square leg. He's in rather no-man's land there. In goes Siddle, bowls against short, and uh, well, Swan confident enough to allow that through on length rather than line. It went over his off stump. Siddle's got a nice necklace on, have you seen? It's a sort of a black and white one, Geoffrey. I just spotted it there on the telly. No, I haven't. Hmm, yeah, look at him in a minute. That's a lucky necklace. In he goes, bowls, short again. Swan uh, ducks underneath it. They've got this plan, clearly, as far as Swan's concerned. With this field, they're going to bowl short at him. Well, they're not going to let him get on the front foot and they'll pitch it up eventually, but they're going to try and force him back a bit. That's happened to you a few times, Jonathan. Yeah, force I never found necessarily was the word. <laughs> you, Jeffrey. It was implanted in your brain, was it? Well, it was just a natural place to go. <laughs> uh, that mid-on's moved a bit. He's gone out of more of a mid-wicket. But this, this is a field for, for short bowling. Siddle again moves in, bowls. There's the Yorker down the leg side, hits on the boot and goes for four. Is that reverse swing? In fact, it's got a bit of bat on it. And uh, flying through fine legs. Siddle saying you're kidding, that came off his boot. There's his <laughs> necklace. Look, what do you reckon of that? Yeah. Do you like it? You see Fred wearing one of those? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I thought jewellery for, for girls until these last few years. You oh. see youngsters wearing earrings, one through the lip, the nose. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't got any piercings? No. Yeah. 164 for seven, Swan waits, Siddle's on his way over the wicket, bowls on the off stump, Swan gets in behind it and just pushes that away, it's the last ball of the over, so uh, Collingwood will be on strike, which is how England want it. 
164 for seven. So uh, 75 behind. And we've got uh, about 15 minutes to go till T. It's the overs mm. been ticking away. There's still 38 to go. There's a new ball that's due in 13 overs. Yeah, they've got the new ball. They've got to see, England have got to start again after T. I thought they wasted half an hour with North Bowl, did the Australians. That was, mm. I don't think any of the ex players I've spoken to could work that out. At the best, if he wanted another spinner, one or two thought Katic, he bowled yes, back at hand still. Interesting, yeah. which Especially against the tail enders. Yeah, perhaps. the tail enders don't pick mm. them so easy. And, and even if you bowled an odd long up, if they don't pick it, it's a bit harder to yeah. hit or play. No, for, for Anderson stroke Monty, might have been interesting to Well, anything Katic of Monty. <laughs> yeah. Now, Horrocks from the far end bowls, and Collingwood again just defends, the ball trickles away. For Horrocks uh, to field, 164 for seven. At T, we're off, I think, on our rounds of the Caribbean, where the West Indies Cricket Board has put out quite a, a feisty statement saying that, uh, well, fine, this is the situation that is. Uh, only those playing against Bangladesh at the moment will be considered for the uh, Champions Trophy. This is Collingwood, forward, mm. played into the offside. And, I don't uh, think that will worry most of the West Indies side. Most of them go to the IPL and earn a hell of a lot more money. Yeah, that's not for the... It's not really well. But Nine, matter, ten months. To keep of it. paying it in your bank account, and it's mm. guaranteed for a few years, is it? How many were? Is it three of them went there? I think there might Bravo. be one or two more going. There's Horrocks outside the off stump. He leaves it, and it's not too far away. On 64 for seven. There's a tour, a big tour of Australia, of course, coming up for Western. Well, maybe they don't want to go. <laughs> Perhaps they don't. <laughs> they haven't looked as if they beat Australia. Do they? I don't think that'll be right. Thrilling for them. Right. Still a high-profile tour, though, isn't it? If you're a professional cricketer, no. you've got to be playing. It's Horrocks tossing it up. Collingwood uh, squeezes it away for a single. They've had a back there in the offside, so uh, there's an easy run. 74 behind, 165 for seven. England trying to hang on. Anyway, we're going to speak to Tony Cozier about what's going on, and then also, hopefully, to, to Lance Gibbs, who, of course, is a former great off-spinner. He doesn't like bowling on here. Mm. now uh, represents the sponsors out there, Digicel, to get that sort of slant on what's going on. Horrocks, Bulls, Swan pads it away. 165 for seven. Fortunately for England, he can play a bit, Swan. Yes, he can. He can play a bit, and he, I've said this before, if you've got a batsman at the other end where Collingwood's playing well, it gives you confidence, because you see him play, middling the ball, you watch how he's coping, and it gives a... If I can call Swan a tail end, which he is, even if he's a good one, it gives you a bit of confidence, doesn't it? Mm. Watching somebody play solidly, sensibly, rather than two tail enders, keep playing and missing, you think, oh, crikey, we're going to get out of here. Horrocks again, bowls. Oh, Swan came down the pitch at him there, then uh, offered the pad. Mm. 165 for seven. He's taken six for about 130 in this game, Nathan Horrocks. <laughs> and England are 74 behind. The T. 15 minutes <coughs> away. Swan four. Collingwood uh, 51. The men out today. Peterson for uh, eight. Strauss 17. Pryor three. Flintoff 26. And Broad 14. Oh, Jeffrey's having a coughing fit, so I'm slapping on the back like a little baby. Try and bring it up. We bring up the wind, Jeffrey. You'll be all right. There you go. You're, you're okay. Have some water. Thank you. Sorry about that. You're all right. Yeah, it's just since I had my cancer right. of the tongue, you know, the throat gets so dry through a day. Off goes Siddle and bowls, and that comes swinging in. It's played uh, into the onside. And there's no running. It's a pat on the back. There you are. Thank you. You're all right. Let's get you sorted out. Well, anybody who's had throat cancer will know you, you have no saliva glands what you take for granted, you know, mm. once when you get so dry, and obviously I do a job which is talking, <laughs> so it gets dry through a day sometimes, very. Would it help if you just talked a little bit less? Or not? <laughs> <laughs> not be good? How did I know? I knew something was coming, I could see well, the you face. Try. So, you can yeah. try. Yeah. <laughs> in goes Siddle over the wicket, bowls, and that's played away to mid-wicket. Yeah. And you love one. that, didn't you? You should see his face well, here, Jeffrey, loving it. You just dug the old bear trap for yourself, really. Yeah, yeah, I just stepped into it, eh? Yeah, I fell into it. <laughs> 166 for seven. Siddle wanders back. 
Being a 73 behind, Ponting spits on his hands. He looks busy, wandering down into the, the slip cordon. He's taken one very good catch today to remove Flint off. Low down, about an inch off the ground. Lovely catch. Still shouting out there. You might have been hussy. And Siddle runs in, bowls to Swan. Oh, hits him! Again with this uh, this field set for short pitch bowling. Swan should know what's coming. And that was dug in short. He didn't play it very well, actually. He took his eye off it. See, this is what happens, Jonathan. They, they get caught in two minds. There's, they're trying to defend the situation, not play a silly shot. And they finish up not playing any sort of shot. Mm. Um, many of the players uh, of England are very good at attacking the bowling. Oh, I think he's hurt a bit, I know. Well, he certainly can take some time by getting the physio out. Yeah. And, uh, Still got to bowl the overs, though. Yeah, they have. Hit him on the, f I think, on the index finger on his left hand. Is that it, or is it right hand? But he, he wasn't looking at it at all. He actually no. was looking in the op opposite <laughs> direction, wasn't he? Easier, easier said than done from up here if you're a lower order man, but that was that was index finger, left hand, and the physio is going to come running out, but, well... You think how much more difficult it was for batsmen, but particularly tail-enders, when there were no helmets. Mm -hmm. When people had hardly anything, didn't have an arm guard or a chest pad, and, and definitely no helmets, and then you got peppered by the fast bowlers, people faster than Siddle. Yeah. There's no wonder they played a few shots, the old tail-enders. They didn't hang around too long when they got bouncers. New physio coming out. I don't recognise... Uh, I don't recognise this one. Mm. It's not Kirk. This has put a lot of weight on. But, um, <laughs> no, it's definitely not Kirk. Not of your background, no, backroom boys, Geoffrey. Must be physio number two. There's plenty of them. <coughs> well, he's having a look at the finger anyway. It's, uh, it's, it's not cut. And well, it's it be, broken and not that. It seems to be bending, yeah. It's his left hand anyway, it's not his spinning hand, it's his index finger of the left hand. Yeah, there was some magic spray applied, that's for sure. And it goes now, in fact. That numbing cold spray. Yeah, you used to get a lot of those when mm. the pitches were uncovered, even more, because rain around like we've had here, that would go on the pitch, it wouldn't be covered, and so it would be touched next day and it'd take off a little bit, you got lots of knocks on your fingers. Well, a chance for the Aussies to have a bit of a breather as well, having a drink. The physio, the mystery, mystery physio slaps uh, Swan on the back, says you'll be all right, <laughs> and then runs off He's all right. with you his bag get, again. Can't yeah. bounce him in the dressing room, can they? No. <laughs> That's rather mysterious. I don't know who that chap is. Anyway, <laughs> Swan, uh, Swan's putting his helmet back on again. Mm. And we'll have to face the music because uh, Siddle hasn't finished this over yet. There's still three balls to go. 35 overs remain after it. There is a new ball to be taken by the Australians. Mm. And England still have lots of batting to do. They've got three wickets left. There's certainly no respite from the weather. There's a lot of blue sky around at the moment. The sun's shining. It's very pleasant. Swan's got his gloves back on again. Peterson, eight. Strauss, 17. Pryor, 14. Flintoff, 26. Broad, 14. The men dismissed today. And Siddle's on his way again. It's a very aggressive field. He goes running in bowls to Swan, inevitably short. Swan's outside the off stump, though, and uh, ignored by Swan. Ah, oh, that was that was Steve McCaig who made his appearance there because Kirk Kirk Russell, our old friend the physio, has been on a long time on paternity leave, uh, apparently. Good old Kirk, mm. didn't know about that. Very nice mm. chap, he's been doing that uh, job for a very long time. Succeeding, of course, the very popular Dean Conway, the Welshman from down here who I saw, uh, saw a couple of days ago watching the cricket. Siddle, bowls short, hits Swan again. Somewhere around the ribs. He, uh, See, he's not into... playing it very well. No. <laughs> he's ducking and weaving into almost everything and getting hit, which I understand is difficult for someone in the lower order, but he, he, it's the same in the lower order as up at front. 
if you start to duck it well so it doesn't hit you or you play it well but he's ducking it he's leaving his arm there he's leaving his elbow there he's not looking at the ball he, he's going to get hurt he's going to hear i'm afraid that's a really poor technique that yes i mean duck and get out of the way right down not not just what i call a little dip of the head duck right down out of spray but other than that i'm not sure there's much you can do really but uh Siddle stares at him saying come on let's get on with the contest but uh, he's clearly in some discomfort but, uh, the arm being bent stretched pressed but again, he played it the same way, Geoffrey, and he, he took his eye off it completely. Yeah. You see, he's not really ducking. Ducking, as I call it, is bending and getting right down, almost stump eye with your head. It's a little cringe, isn't it? Is that is that a appropriate word? It's it's. I don't mean to give the impression uh, badly, but it's a kind of nothingness. It doesn't do anything. It just oh, cranky. I don't like that sort of That's thing. Crouch rather than crouch, crouch, is it? Little little yes. Cringing crouch. It's okay. nothing. It doesn't really. And so he's still in the firing line. His arms, his elbow, his hands, his body. Well, he's got a little bit of tubic grip going on here, perhaps just to, to make him feel a bit better. Well, that's not going to offer very much, really, but uh, that's been cut to size. It's not easy for tailenders, as you know. No. But the one thing you have to do, if you're going to duck, is learn to duck well. Get right down and out of the way. Well, the art to doing it, supposedly, is to, is to duck while well, obviously watching the ball at the same time, isn't it? So he can make a late... Adjustment. Yeah, and the best practice you can ever have is go on something hard like concrete, get somebody to bowl at you with a tennis ball that bounces alarmingly, and keep looking at it, get the, get the idea of how to look at the ball. You must look at the ball, and with a tennis ball you can, because even if you misjudge it, it not hurt, so you can actually get used to it a bit. Yeah. You've got to get used to it. Well, we're waiting, there's a phone-in tonight on uh, mm -hmm. Five Live. Mark Chapman uh, is hosting... <coughs> And Ash is uh, 6.06 from 7 o'clock. So you can uh, start to get your calls in there, can you? I think the usual numbers from 6 o'clock. 166 for 7. Poor old Graham Swan has been in the wars and he's back again. He's got his bat in his hand. So there's one ball to go in this interminable over. Well, Graham's not very sympathetic. OK, there is one. And uh, looking at the field, I think Graham Swan knows what he's going to get because uh, everyone there really is set for the short ball. And he's just at the moment like a coconut in a shy. Two slips, a gully, leg slip, short leg, short mid wicket, short extra cover, deep square leg, fine leg. In goes Siddle and he bowls to him. Short, oh, he's fended off just short of Katic. He's too short. He's well, sort of useless there, he's Katic. He's got an absolute earful there as well from Siddle at the end of the over. I, 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 anyway, I don't really blame him, really. I mean, he stood there. But he has played that very, very poorly, I think. And uh, he's, he's going to have to sort out a technique about how to play the short ball because he's a good, clumping, hard-hitting batsman when it's pitched up. But uh, start digging it in with that field. And he's just taking his eye off, off every ball. And uh, the last one hit him up on the bottom glove. Well, it might just actually have been off the bat handle when it hit him. That would have been quite an interesting one for, for the referral system because I suspect the umpire would have given him out. In fact, it was just holding the bat, I think, when it uh, when the uh, the ball hit his glove. Siddle's furious. He's like he's like one of those wrestlers in WWF. Going down there and well, he's offered him some sort of advice. I think that was. You ask him which restaurant he wants to go to dinner. Might be. Might well have been. But listen, their short legs miles too short. He's, look at him here with the spinner and all. It's quite it's, deep, isn't he? He's unbelievably deep. Horrocks moves in, Bowles will probably be the last over before T, and Collingwood plays the first ball defensively back to him. 166 for seven, pretty fiery out there. If we keep on like this, he keeps stopping everybody, Swan, it'll be too dark to get all their overs in. Look at the lights on. <laughs> no, you see, you can't see properly, they came no. off. Once for that, red ball in the floodlights. Horrocks tosses this up, oh, finds the edge, the ball runs away to slip. Clark Fields, 166 for seven. Well, what's Swan going to do in the tea break? He needs to get a suit of armour on, by the look of it. One sixty-six for seven. Horrocks bowls. Collingwood goes back, forces off the back foot through the offside. They'll take two. The fielder there picks it up just inside the boundary. 
168 for seven. Well, I will say about Swan, I mean, he's not backing away or anything. He's not, uh, I mean, he's standing up to it, but he's just, the technique is wrong. He's just not watching the ball at all. He's standing there and getting hit. 168 for seven. 71 behind. Horitz bowls. Collingwood again picks up a single. By the same shot, forcing it into the offside to bring Swan down to face Horitz with two balls to go. And probably the last two balls of this session. 169 for seven. Horitz will ball over the wicket. Swan settles in. Four men around the bat. Ponting, chewing his gum just a couple of yards in front of Swan as Horitz comes in, bowls to him. He plays no spoke outside the off stump. Horitz appeals optimistically. No one else supported it. 169 for seven. Here comes the last ball of this afternoon's session, a longer session. Horitz bowls it. Swan goes back, plays it carefully. Ponting fields. And that's it. Play will resume in 20 minutes' time with England with three wickets left. Going into the last session of the Test match. Australia need three wickets to win it. Collingwood has defended stoutly all afternoon. He's added just 20 runs in that time. And Swan, battered and bruised, is on four. And that session added, uh, what, two for 67. In the uh, overs at the bowl, the wickets of Flintoff and Broad. And uh, well, it's been a it's been a tussle, Jeffrey. I mean, 34 overs bowled in those uh, two and a half hours since lunch. I mean, the obvious question for people listening uh, in this country, first of all, um, and next door, of course, in England, uh, is whether England can save it. What do you think? I think they'll struggle. It is possible. I think Collingwood's batted really, really well. He, he's decided on his way of playing right from the first ball this morning. He stuck to that. He's not done anything silly. Um, he's just waited till a pretty bad ball and then picked it off. And he's known that the runs he scores are handy, but they're not going to make much impression on the game. It's whether he can keep his wicket intact. And while he's there, particularly, gives hope and help to the tail-enders. Mm. But throughout that, there's not much else I could say about England's batting. There have been too many mistakes, too many poor shots. People have not been able to adapt to the situation, which is of saving the game. They dug themselves into this hole, or jumped into it, you might say, and have not really, most of them, been able to find a way to get out. They made some poor shots, starting with Peterson's misjudgment this morning. And then Andrew Strauss cutting one, in, it just bounced a bit. I mean, there's no point in going through it, but I think they do have a chance. But I wouldn't hold your breath and I won't be nipping down to the bookies with me money. There's a new ball, is to come. Yeah, that's, that's, important. that's important, isn't it? And they're going to keep peppering Swan. Yeah because he's a good player if he's allowed to get on the front foot. And if they happen to get one of the right handers out, I mean, Anderson can play a bit, Monty, Monty, they polished him off with spin. I mean, they will pepper them both. They will get some really fearful short stuff and then Horitz will try and turn it, which is away from the two left-hand tail-enders. A bit worrying to see Swan, I mean, very worrying from his point of view, to see him playing like that, but, uh, I mean, now people are just running the ball short at him. He'll get it all through field. the series. Any, yeah. any test match as he plays, he'll get short stuff till he, bowl, till he plays it better. Yeah. And then they'll stop bowling it. But, I mean, that's it. That's why you have to learn to look at the ball. I say, old kids, get a tennis ball on a hard surface somebody to bowl and learn to make yourself, really make yourself look at it. And you might miss it a few times, misjudge it, it might hit you on the head, but it's not going to hurt. But yeah. it's going to get you into the habit of really looking at the ball and, and eventually avoiding it well while still looking at it. It is the really one key factor. Forget anything else, you have to look at the ball. Not easy to do when you're frightened it's going to hurt you, but you have to learn to do that. 169 for 7, thank you, Geoffrey. You're going to have a break. Collingwood 55, Swan 4, England are 70 behind.